technology, we still have this opportunity to share our knowledge and our experience through the cyberspace. During these events, we host 30 lecturers around the world and more than 500 participants as an educational program. Obviously, designing such a program needs careful inspection of every detail. So let me express my gratitude for the effort of Professor Jalaipa and also Professor Shirhoda, who is now in operation room, and all the members of um, organizing committee, especially international <coughs> uh, relationship department of Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Uh, we have three, uh, we have six section for this webinar. The first one is today, it uh, starts now, and uh, the others will be continued uh, every Friday for six weeks. Now, uh, I will going to turn over the webinar to the chairman of the first session, Professor Mahmoud Zaide, who is the Dean of Cancer Institute, and uh, I wish you all some delightful hours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Omranifu. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Happy New Year. I would like to take opportunity to wish your new year is filled with success, prosperity, health, and happiness. And of course, a year without COVID-19 all over the globe. On behalf of Cancer Institute, I would like, uh, I have the honor to host you for, for the first program of the minimally invasive surgery webinar run by Cancer Institute of Tehran University of Medical Science. Here, I want also to commemorate Dr. Dashti, uh, who was our colleague uh, whom recently we have lost. And also I want to appreciate all of my colleagues, especially uh, the colleague in office of Vice Chancellor for Global Strategies and International Affairs who support us for this webinar. My special thanks goes for Dr. Jalaifar because in fact, the idea of this webinar uh, was firstly hashed by him. Uh, our first program uh, is dedicated to esophageal cancer minimally invasive surgeries. It's encompassed seven lecture, very interesting lecture by uh, very well-known scientists all over the world. Uh, I hope you enjoy participating in this webinar and find it useful and effective in your practice. Now we uh, will look very shortly on esophageal cancer epidemiology and history uh, by this PowerPoint. Okay, as you know, the esophageal, uh, esophageal cancer is the eighth most common type of cancer worldwide. As for cancer deaths, he has a rank of six in worldwide, but it is in the third world uh, countries, third world countries operate to rank four. So it shows it's very, very little in, uh, as a cancer. Uh, Esophageal cancer characterized by highly mortality rates, poor prognosis at the time of diagnosis. Unfortunately, we detect this cancer very late. As you know, dysphagia uh, as a symptom that the patient comes to us, we detected it when the cancer obstructed lumen of the esophagus was more than 60%. So we, because of late diagnosis, uh, we detected in very, higher stages. So the chance of uh, treatment is calmed down. And the 
as a geographic location, it's very variable. And uh, you see the highest point of this cancer is located in the Southern and Eastern Africa and Eastern Asia that we are now. And the lowest part is in the uh, Western Central Africa and Central America. We have two common type of the pathology in the esophagus lumen, squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. And uh, we are witness, uh, the point is that we are we faced with a noticeable rising trend in adenocarcinoma uh, in these decades. And it may be partially because of changing lifestyle or inc and increasing the BMI of people and a better socioeconomic situation. Uh, as a risk factor, we uh, will discuss in very detail in the first lecture. Uh, unfortunately, we have not an established and organized screening program for esophageal cancer, especially for squamous cell carcinoma. And for uh, adenocarcinoma, there is some, but it's not very, very effective. The overall, uh, overall survival, because this cancer is very lethal and we uh, diagnose this cancer in very high stage, the five-year survival of this cancer is between 10 to 15%. And uh, with the best effort as a curative intention, surgery and chemoradiotherapy, it, it increased to 40%. Uh, the history of this can uh, the esophageal cancer is very nice. If you, uh, if you, uh, study uh, the history of this cancer. Uh, the first successful surgery was done in 1913. It's about near 100 years passed from the first successful surgery. And the minimally invasive surgery, it has a history at the age of near 30 years. So it's very young. Uh, in order to compromise the efficacy of minimally invasive surgery and uh, with the gold standard form, I mean the open uh, surgery, there are many trials to compare the efficacy and the secure, uh, safety of minimally invasive surgery. The time trial is one of them that is very well known and it, it recruited 115 patients in, and run in 2012 from five uh, country and more than seven, I suppose it's more seven center participate in this trial. In this trial shows uh, the, uh, the superiority of this uh, procedure, minimally invasive surgery in comparison to open surgery because in terms of blood loss, acute immunologic response, uh, in pulmonary infection, hospital stay, and pain score and also quality of life. So it shows that, that minimally invasive surgery of the uh, esophagus cancer now maybe is a standard for us. So uh, we back to uh, first lecture and I should uh, hello to uh, Professor Melona, uh, Molenda and also Professor uh, Steve. And uh, I will be very happy to see you here. And I ask you, please uh, start your nice lecture. Uh, I, I, I'm, I, sh I wish it will be very hot topic and we, I will use it very, very uh, high. Thank you. I hear you. Well, thank you so much. It's a great honor to be able to join you and colleagues from around the world in this important symposium. And it's great that we can do this virtually, uh, as you said, during these trying and challenging times. So hopefully everybody's safe and well and settled back with a nice coffee or cappuccino. And uh, I'd like to say good morning to Dr. Molina, my uh, counter uh, speaker on this talk. We are gonna go back and forth a little bit. We'll hopefully keep it 
engaging for everybody. And, uh, you know, like all surgeons, we don't agree on everything. So there may be a few points of contention as we move through things. Good morning, uh, Dr. Molina. Would you like to say hello to sure. everybody? Good morning, everyone. I want to thank the organization. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, and uh, participate in such a nice symposium with uh, a lot of friends and colleagues from all over the world. So um, I'm ready to go ahead with our discussion. Terrific. Well, we're going to talk please about ask question. Sorry, if you have any question, go on the chat and we'll be sure to answer. Very good. So Dr. Molina is uh, the director of the esophageal surgery program. She's an associate professor at Memorial Sloan Kettering. I am uh, in a private practice group in Portland, Oregon. I used to be at the University of Southern California and left that about four years ago now and um, uh, in private practice in Portland, Oregon. And so we're gonna talk to you this morning about stage and risk factor guided approach to the treatment of esophageal cancer. And we'll kind of do a whirlwind tour of esophageal cancer. And then I know with other lectures throughout the course, there'll be more uh, focused approaches to some of, the, some of the particular issues. So with that in mind, disclosures, nothing relevant to this talk for either Dr. Molina or myself. So the first question, Dr. Molina, how in your mind do you break down different stages of esophageal cancer? Well, I'm glad you said in your mind, uh, because of course, we all are going to follow uh, AJCC um, staging uh, guidelines. Uh, but if you can advance the slide, uh, I think that when I think about esophageal cancer, uh, in, in a simplistic way, I like to divide them in superficial tumors. Uh, those superficial tumors are those that are confined to the mucosa or maybe just a superficial submucosa. And uh, they have a very low risk of having lymph nodal metastasis. Uh, other class of tumors are those are local regional tumors. And those are the ones that we see more frequently. Those are those that can infiltrate, invade into the submucosa, and they have risk of uh, nodal invasion involvement. Then we have extensive local regional disease. We see a fair amount of these patients as well, since esophageal cancer is not very symptomatic in the beginning. Uh, those are tumors that are bulky, people have dysphagia with, and often multi-level nodal disease. And then unfortunately, we see a fair amount of number of patients uh, with systemic tumors. So tumors that involve distant organs or no regional lymph nodes or have carcinomatosis in the peritoneum. So I'm going to turn it back to you, Dr. Mister. So why don't we focus first on the superficial tumors? Uh, how do you define what is superficial and uh, what is important uh, about these tumors? So I would say, and I think we probably agree that a superficial tumor is one that's confined certainly to the mucosa and probably the superficial submucosa, at least for um, adenocarcinoma. There's some differences there. I know we'll touch on those. But the really important thing is, regardless of whether it's intramucosal or just into the submucosa, it has to have a very low risk of lymph node metastases. So that's the important thing, a very low risk of lymph node metastases because you can treat these endoscopically without an esophagectomy and lymphadenectomy. But a key thing is that curative treatment is expected in these patients. So you can't compromise the survival from these tumors because very few patients with these superficial tumors should die from esophageal cancer. So you've got to keep that first and foremost. You were fortunate to find a curable lesion and you really don't want to compromise the survival in that group. So Dr. Molina, how do you assess or stage a superficial tumor and how do you determine the risk for lymph node metastases in these lesions? And then are there differences or important differences you think between adenocarcinoma and squamous cancers? Yeah, so I wanna start with a case study. I think that will uh, really help us to move through this discussion. So this is a patient to recently uh, I took care of a uh, six-year-old woman, never smoker, no use of alcohol. She just had an endoscopy done because her GERD symptoms wouldn't get better, even with PPI. And uh, uh, you can see here the pictures of what they found. So um, a little small nodule uh, within the middle of the esophagus. 
and biopsy of this is a squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, so what do we do with this uh, tumors? How do we assess this uh, tumor uh, in, um, fully to really understand why is the best treatment for her? Can advance the slide? Yeah, I was just going to make a comment. You know, that really, I think in the United States in particular, we don't see that much squamous cancer because that does not look like granulation tissue. And then whenever you see something like that, it's important to understand, is that the only site of disease? And so uh, we'll, we'll touch into that. But clearly, that is not granulation tissue. So the mm -hmm. good thing they biopsied it. Right, right. So, you know, when you evaluate, when you think you're dealing with a superficial tumor, I think it's very, very important to, first of all, do a very careful evaluation with endoscopy. And sometimes endoscopy alone with white light might not be enough. And you wanna uh, try to really look at all the areas of abnormality with uh, the help of chromoendoscopy, either MBI or Lugol staining, depending on the histology. And, uh, and really look very carefully is because this area, this cancer can be multifocal at times. And, you know, if you see nodules, ulcerations, or areas of irregularity, uh, you should take a biopsy to really understand the extension of the disease. In my opinion, I think that EMR, ESD, is the best staging tool. Sometimes it's a curative tool. But, but the most important thing is that it is a staging tool. So if you have any nodule or any raised area, don't miss the opportunity to remove it because that will give you the best definition of what the risk factors are for that tumor to involve more widely, uh, for example, the lymph nodes. In early stage disease, uh, sometime I like to get a PET scan. I'm sure Dr. Zemis doesn't agree with that. Uh, but uh, especially for a patient that I'm not quite sure if endoscopic resection is gonna be successful. Uh, I think that we're looking right now risk factors of uh, successful endoscopic therapy. And I think that uh, SUV uptake might help us guide us uh, in the future. Uh, and then remember, so US is good, but we're moving away from U.S. staging because U.S. is just good for advanced stage. And you know, post-stage will need treatment that is a more multidisciplinary um, oriented. And so for early stage, especially T1 tumors, U.S. is highly unreliable. And I prefer EMR ESD for staging tool. Yeah, I, I agree. The issue I have with PET scan is that uh, I think the, the risk of lymph node metastasis in these early tumors is so low, you're equally likely to have a false positive PET scan. The other thing is it takes time. And I've seen a number of patients that have gone down the rabbit hole of getting a PET scan, seen an oncologist, and weeks go by before they get the really definitive staging of an EMR or ESD. Yeah, but often, you know, the patient goes for endoscopic therapy and that's not possible. And there's a partial resection and then they get a PET scan and then everything is lighting up because they just set a procedure. So I agree with you that it's not 100% necessary, but sometimes I, in my opinion, it's helpful. So uh, one of the most important factors to guide you in treatment is really the assessment of the depth and the risk, uh, the depth of invasion to assess the risk of neural involvement. And this is key for early stage disease. And it is a little bit different uh, for adenocarcinoma and squamous. So in the Western world, we see a lot more adenocarcinoma. And we have learned that the tumors that are only involving the mucosa usually have very, very low risk of neural involvement. And those are the tumors that we treat successfully when endoscopic uh, therapy. Now, there are some tumors that are involving the superficial submucosa, uh, those uh, low risk T1B that sometimes also can be treated endoscopically because of their low risk of um, nodal involvement, I'll uh, talk a little bit more some other risk factor in a minute. With squamous cells, a little different. I think for uh, it, it equal uh, involvement of depth of mucosa, squamous cell cancer have a higher risk of nodal disease. In fact, even with involvement of the muscularis mucosa, squamous cell cancer should be really treated a little bit more aggressively because you'll have about a 12% risk of nodal invasion just with involvement of uh, muscularis mucosa. So for us in the Western world that we don't see a lot of squamous, sometimes it's really hard you know, to uh, separate these two and treat them appropriately. Uh, but we really need to make an effort because at, at the same stage level, squamous cell is more aggressive than adenocarcinoma. 
Now, there are additional risk factors that are very important to consider when you're trying to decide whether uh, endoscopic treatment is uh, sufficient for uh, curative treatment. Uh, tumor size more than two centimeter, uh, the uh, presence of poor differentiation within the cancer, uh, lymphovascular invasion, and then uh, the depth of penetration in the submucosa, which is different, uh, as I said uh, a minute ago, between squamous and other carcinoma. So for adenocarcinoma, we feel okay uh, with depth up to 500 microns into the submucosa. But with squamous cell, really we should worry about uh, more lymph nodal involvement with a penetration of 200 mic microns and, and above. Uh, so, so the EMR, ESD really help us to define these risk factors. And when we did a multi-center study looking at muc some mucosal tumor that then underwent esophagectomy, you can see listed here that for T1A tumors, uh, really there were no nodal involvement at all. But for T1B tumor, for each risk factor that I mentioned above, the risk of nodal disease increased significantly with, with uh, no risk is virtually zero. And with uh, many, uh, with all the risk factors, you have about 50% chance of having nodal involvement. So this is a factor that's very important to consider because if you're trying to cure a patient, uh, with endoscopic therapy, uh, as the doctor and Mr. said earlier, you know, you don't wanna miss your opportunity to cure the patient. Um, and in fact, in a second, um, if you move ahead of the slides, in the, um, you know, a study that we looked at uh, treatment with esophagectomy of patients with neural disease, this patient can be virtually cured, especially when their lymph nodes are not involved, and up to uh, over 60% cure rate uh, when lymph nodes were involved. So, uh, it, it is nice and, uh, and great that we can feed this patient with endoscopic treatment, but we don't want to be overly optimistic and then miss the opportunity of cure patients uh, that indeed needs a more aggressive approach like yeah. uh, resection. And this is for surgical resection alone, primary surgical resection, no adjuvant therapy, and we'll get into adjuvant therapy, but now we know if you have a nodal burden after surgery, there is a benefit to adjuvant therapy. But yeah, primary surgery alone in these patients is very successful. So you shouldn't lose the opportunity to cure somebody with submucosal tumor invasion and risk factors for lymph nodes. So we're just going to go back to the case. So this patient had a new S stage T1 and went on to have an ESD that you see here, uh, almost circumferential in uh, one area. And uh, as often you see pathology, uh, it uh, you know, shows a moderately to poorly differentiated, uh, no mention on the size, uh, T1B tumor, no mention on the depth of penetration, uh, but no LVI and all margins are negative. Uh, so uh, often from pathology, this, these tumors are really difficult to evaluate by pathology. And often you need expert GI pathologists to have a very uh, thorough assessment, you know, what the risk factors are to determine what do we do next with this patient now? So yeah, in the absence of knowing the depth of submucosal invasion, then you're kind of not sure where you stand with the risk of lymph nodes uh, in this patient, huh? Exactly. So Dr. Molina, given all this, what are your recommendations for endoscopic therapy or esophagectomy in these patients with a superficial cancer? So I'm, I'm sure we're gonna have some uh disagreement on this as well. But in my mind, I keep it simple. And I think there are patients that, that for sure, I would offer them endoscopic therapy. Those are all patients that have only high grade dysplasia of T1A tumor. They have a good esophageal function. Uh, they are patient, they are reliable because endoscopic therapy is not one-stop shop. You have to come over after and after and after until all the virus is eradicated and multiple endoscopies. And then for patients that are older or that have high risk factors for surgery, uh, then I would consider just endoscopic resection for T1B tumors that either have no risk factors or maybe one risk factor, especially if that risk factor is a poor differentiation or size. I'm a little bit more nervous with the lymphovascular invasion. And then there are patients that for sure I will offer esophagectomy. If I have a young patient that is a 
good candidate and very low risk uh, for complications after esophagectomy. It has a T1B tumor or even a squamous cancer where the T1A invading the miscalaris mucosa, I'll definitely offer esophagectomy to that patient. Now, of course, if there are positive resection margin after T1B ESD uh, or a T1B with multiple risk factors, so then definitely I would say esophagectomy is the way to go. And then there are some patients that are non-compliant that are not going to commit to this uh, treatment course or the esophagus is really end stage. And so in those patients really trying to save the esophagus where it's not functional is really uh, non-meaningful. And so for those, I think esophagectomy is more indicated. And then there's a group of patients. We didn't, uh, we don't have a lot of time to go into it, but the holy grail, of course, in these patients you're talking about, the young patients with the early submucosal tumors, the holy grail is, of course, some form of sentinel node identification. I know you're doing work on that. Maybe you want to just say a couple words about where that might take us. Yeah, so I hope in the future we're doing it right now a prospective trial and trying to really reliably identify sentinel node for esophageal cancer has been a little bit of a process. A lot of people have tried in the past and uh, the results are not always so clear, but uh, ideally if we can identify the presence of sentinel node, then these patients with the T1B tumor, we can just assess the nodes. And if the node, if the central node is negative, then we know we can successfully treat them with endoscopic therapy. So that would be the final goal of our trial. But for now, we're still in the process of seeing if even a central node exists for esophageal cancer. So going back to the case by case. So there are patients that it's not so straight cut. You know, you, you want to have a discussion with the patient and see uh, where that will lead you. So if we have patients that are older, uh, or high risk for, uh, for surgery. And even if they have maybe one or two risk factors, you wanna have a discussion with them, whether it's worth you know, taking a chance with the surveillance or if it's more worth taking a chance with the operation. Um, also patient that are high risk with deep margin, sometimes the deep margin is very, very difficult to evaluate by pathology. And there might be some cauterized areas and there might not be any residual disease. Often we do surgery for T1B with positive margin and we find no residual disease in the specimen. So one by one case, especially in uh, uh, very high risk patients. And then sometimes in cases of multifocal disease where really eradication of the entire area at risk is very complicated. I don't know if you want to add anything to this, uh, or if you uh, if you also use kind of the same approach uh, to to surgery or to offering surgery yeah, to this patient. No, I think that's I think that's very true. There are times that I'll yeah I'm a, a huge component or a huge fan of endoscopic therapy, but there are patients with just extensive disease with uh, you know risk factors that I just know are gonna make it difficult to get that disease under control that I think are best treated with esophagectomy. So yeah, there are certainly case by case variations from the, the typical pattern. Well, this patient uh, of mine, um, you know, the, endos the gastroenterologist decided that the EMR was uh, enough for the patient. And uh, of course, you know, a month after this almost circumferential ESD, patient developed a stricture and dysphagia. And this was handled with balloon dilation, steroid injection. Uh, so I, I think that Dr. Miss, we should talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what are the key uh, points to consider when you do endotherapy and how can you avoid complication like this one that we uh, see in this patient? Well, there's no question that if you can do endoscopic therapy, I think it's preferred by the patients and, and by many of us that do these procedures because compared to an esophagectomy, number one, it allows organ preservation and number two, it significantly reduces the morbidity and mortality. Most of these procedures are outpatient. They go home the same day. It is time consuming. They're gonna come back multiple times, particularly if they have multifocal disease a key principle, though, is you have to address all of the disease. There's sometimes a concept that you just take out the tumor and leave the other precancerous tissue there. I think that's fallacious. These patients have demonstrated that they have whatever genetic component that should keep these things in check missing, and these tumors will develop in the other precancerous areas. So it's a mistake to just pluck out the one weed in the esophagus and assume no other weeds are gonna grow when there is precancerous tissue elsewhere in the esophagus. So it typically requires multiple treatment sessions. 
And uh, the last thing you want to do is successfully treat one early tumor and then have the patient come back with a more advanced tumor and you've cost them the chance at survival. And then the other important lesion uh, issue is the, there are precancerous lesions, Barrett's tissues and so forth that uh, you just can't ignore. So it's critical to really look at the areas of disease and be aggressive with it. And one of the things I've learned over the years is that when I would go down in a, in a big field of Barrett's and pluck out the one tumor, we would eight, wait about eight weeks to come back for the next session and there'd already be another nodule there. So then I would pluck that one out. And then I'd come back in eight weeks and there'd be another nodule. So I never got ahead of the disease. So I've learned that you have to be very aggressive. So I'll immediately, I'll take out the, the, any nodule that I see and then begin treating with ablation or other therapies, the residual disease right away so that we can kind of get ahead of the disease. You do have to be careful because you don't want to ablate or treat over an area where you've done your endoscopic resection, since this can lead to perforation that was demonstrated nicely uh, by Jock Bergman in the Netherlands in a study. So you got to be careful, but with the tools we have today, and we'll talk briefly about those later, there are ways to begin immediately treating these other precancerous areas so that you can really get ahead of the disease. So those are, those are a couple important issues. Another thing that we're going to talk about in a, in a little more detail in a minute is that if you're going to do an endoscopic resection that's uh, larger than about 10 millimeters, you're going to have to likely do piecemeal resection. And I know there's, we'll, we can get into that a little bit, and there's concerns about piecemeal resection, but if you really understand the disease, the only important margin is the deep margin everything else laterally you should be able to address. It's the deep margin that you need to know about because that determines the risk factors for lymph nodes. And even in a piecemeal resection with endoscopic uh, techniques, you can always find the deep margin status. So a key thing is if you're gonna have a, a larger lesion, you need to avoid using the Olympus cap because you cannot do a overlapping resections with the Olympus cap, it's too risky for a perforation. In these cases, you must use the band technique because then you can do overlapping resections and avoid leaving any tissue between the resections. You wanna get all of the cancer out. So you resect until all the nodular abnormal tissue is out. And then if you have smooth or slightly irregular abnormal tissue, you can treat that with your other ablative technologies but you wanna make sure your lateral margin is clear from cancer because it could be difficult if you come back after that endoscopic resection site is healed to do additional endoscopic therapy because of the scarring from the previous resection. To reduce the risk of stricture, you really wanna to try to avoid circumferential EMR or ESD. You don't, you, you can stage these. You take out the biggest portion or the worst portion of the lesion, try to get just to the edges of sort of more normal tissue, and you can come back in eight weeks and get the rest. You don't need to do the whole thing at once because these strictures can be challenging to manage. So the risk factors for stricture are circumferential and very long. So if you add more than three or four centimeters and circumferential, you're almost guaranteed a stricture. And if you can, it'd be much safer to break that into pieces. For squamous tumors, Lugol stain can very nicely help you identify the areas of dysplasia, but it makes the esophageal mucosa very sticky and it's difficult to get your EMR caps and devices down there. So you may wanna go down and mark the areas of abnormality with your cautery tip or, so, or argon beam and then try to wash all that Lugol's off, and then you're gonna have a little easier time getting your caps in. Recent studies have suggested that NBI is as effective as Lugol's, so you may even begin to move away from Lugol's if you're, if you're comfortable using NBI to identify these areas of abnormalities. That's a really a good over, um, um, overall um, description, so, um, what so moving forward what is the endoscopic approach that you most use for this tumors and uh, what are the differences in between what you like one versus the other and when do you use one versus the other 
So it all starts with ear resection. If you have any nodular disease, it's really mandatory that you take that out because you don't know if you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg and the tumor is going much deeper or if all you have is a little sub, you know, a little mucosal abnormality or a mucosal cancer. So the only way to reliably know that is to take the lesion out and that starts with your endoscopic resection. Most commonly, I use endoscopic mucosal resection. And on the, you see on the left side, the Olympus cap. These were the first things developed and I was using these back in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s. They make a very large cap and you can take bigger lesions out. The, what, the problem is that the, the device will suck up the muscularis propria. So if you do an adjacent resection, like for example, in the slide here, it's perfect for taking out that, you know, about eight or nine millimeter nodule. But if you had to take out a bigger nodule, you would not want to use that because of the risk of perforation. Instead, we use the band technique. And on the right-hand side here, you see the banders. There's several companies that make them. But you suck the lesion up into the band, into the cap, and then apply the band. The band is not strong enough to hold up the muscularis propria. So you can do overlapping resections and clean out large areas of the esophagus right down to the muscularis propria. Uh, in, in stages with this device. So I think these, that's an important issue to determine which cap to use based on the size of the disease that you need to remove at that time. Now ESD is, uh, is very popular and we'll talk about some of the issues there. Um, there are a number of knives and uh, cutting devices used for it. It's quite simple, although it's, it is challenging in some ways, but basically it's it's a submucosal space operation. So you incise the mucosa, you lift the submucosa up and they take your knife and you follow that submucosal or muscularis propria plane, similar to a poem procedure, and then excise that lesion. You can take out very large lesions on block, which is why it's been popularized. And I just wanna say a couple of words about the studies that are out there because understanding some of these differences is very important. So in a meta-analysis of 22 studies, you can see the references there, ESD associated with a higher on-block resection rate, no surprise because you can take the entire thing out at once and a, a higher R0 resection rate because you're generally taking very wide margins around the lesion. They had a lower local recurrence rate but longer procedure time and more perforations than endoscopic resection with similar bleeding and stricture rates. And then a separate study compared ESD and MR, EMR based on lesion size. Now, the important thing to understand is that these studies are all using the Olympus cap or the majority are using the Olympus cap. And as you can see in the pictures at the bottom here, they use the Olympus cap where you put the wire at the bottom of the cap and you can really only do one resection because of the risk of perforation if you take adjacent resections. So for smaller lesions, the, the lesion size A, which is less than 10 millimeters, they could get everything in the cap and things were quite successful. For the bigger lesions, size C, 16 to 20 millimeters, obviously that's too big to fit in the cap. And since they couldn't do adjacent resections, it's no surprise that things may be different. We'll go through the data in a minute here. But an important thing to recognize is had they used in bigger lesions, the cap technique with the bander rather than the Olympus cap, they could have done multiple resections on these bigger lesions and gotten a complete resection. So this is the data. Remember only a single resection with the EMR because they were using the Olympus cap. So clearly the procedure time is much, much shorter regardless of the group for the endoscopic mucosal resection. But as you can see, as you work your way down, significant differences in the on block resection rate and the R0 resection rate in favor of ESD for these larger lesions. Again, because they only did a single endoscopic resection because they're using the Olympus cap. This all would have gone away if they'd used the bander and taken out the entire lesion in multiple bites with the band. Yes, it wouldn't be an on block resection, but they could have had an R0 resection and that's all that really matters. So I disagree with the conclusions that ESD is superior. And I think you have to understand the technologies to know. 
And then of course, uh, they showed that there was a higher use of additional ablation devices with the, e with the endoscopic mucosal resection, the EMR, because in these larger lesions, they couldn't get it all out with a single EMR. So understand the differences in the devices and that helps you understand the literature is, is all I'm gonna say about that. When we come to ablation technologies, we have so many opportunities. Radio frequency ablation has been used worldwide for both Barrett's, adenocarcinomas, and squamous uh, lesions. Again, you don't want to use these ablation devices, particularly the, the radio frequency ablation on nodular disease because the depth of penetration is limited. You minimize the risk of stricture with these devices because it only goes to the muscularis mucosa. So it will not treat a deeper lesion. For deeper lesions, you have the opportunity to use cryoablation or photodynamic therapy. For long segment lesions, photodynamic therapy is very nice, particularly for squamous tumors. It works extremely well. It's been used on the skin for obvious uh, skin lesions, and it works equally well for early squamous tumors in the esophagus. And then for a very focal treatment, the argon beam coagulation is a, uh, a good option as well. So we have a lot of options for ablation of surrounding precancerous tissue. Key though is to get the nodular disease out with our endoscopic resection devices. All right, well, let's move forward a little bit. Dr. Molino, when do you use neoadjuvant therapy and what is your strategy for neoadjuvant therapy for each tumor type? And how do you factor in things like tumor location into your treatment algorithm? And is surgery always important? Well, that's a very long question, but I'm gonna try to make it a very simple this, uh, description. So. Unfortunately, these are the majority of patients that we treat, right? Uh, esophageal cancer is not very symptomatic in the early stage. You're very lucky if you go for an endoscopy and find a T1 tumor. But for the most part, people come in because of dysphagia. And when they have dysphagia, majority have a T3 tumor. And so those tumors are treated with multimodality treatment. And it's different whether the patient had a tumor located in the proximal esophagus or in the distal esophagus, but also I think histology is key for treatment uh, determination. So for cervical esophageal cancer, most of these patients are treated with definitive uh, chemo radiation. You know, the, uh, the chance of losing uh, the vocal cords and larynx uh, is a, uh, it's a, it's a very life-changing um, surgery. And so we really only uh, uh, keep that, op that, that option for patients that recur after definitive chemotherapy and radiation. Luckily, squamous cell cancer have a good response to radiation. And uh, uh, so the, only the minority of patients will recur and will need some uh, uh, type of uh, you know, surgical treatment for their disease. Now, when you go to mid to, to distal esophagus, again, most likely um, the mid esophagus uh, will see squamous type of cancer and uh, often areas of uh, um, a lot of you know, airways or uh, aorta or pericardium around. So not a lot of wide resection is possible. And the tumor is often bulky tumor. So for those patients, I think radiation really is key. And for squamous cell uh, cancer, I think radiation is really uh, important because of the sensitivity to it. And I'll talk a little bit about plus minus surgery you know, after you obtain a good response for this uh, uh, patient. Uh, for adenocarcinoma, which we see them mostly in the GE junction or the cardia of the esophagus, uh, we are kind of moving away from the uh, cross regimen. Uh, as you know, the cross regimen, carbotoxyl radiation really has changed a little bit the way we treat this disease. And in the Western world, especially in the United States, cross regimen is so well tolerated that has become um, very commonly used in every patient with esophageal cancer is treated with cross regimen. Well, if you remember the data on the CROSS trial, really that was uh, very good for squamous cell cancer, but the response rate for adenocarcinoma was not as good as for a squamous cell. And so we kind of moved away from the CROSS regimen for adeno. And uh, we'll show a little bit, we use more uh, chemotherapy uh, 5-FU based, uh, or we've switched away from radiation altogether. You know, these patients uh, with tumor in the distal esophagus don't have a lot of issues for resection. So we can be a little bit more aggressive with uh, the radial uh, aspect of the resection. And so 
we're less worried about radial margin and therefore uh, radiation might not help us uh, in these situations. So I want to just show quickly uh, the CLGB80803 trial, which is basically what we use at Memorial Cattery now for adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. And this is a protocol that is a PET-directed approach. Uh, therefore, we do a PET before and after uh, two cycles of induction chemotherapy alone. And with that, we determine whether the patient's tumor responds to that particular chemotherapy. And if it doesn't respond uh, on, uh, in terms of PAT decrease uptake, then we switch them to a different chemotherapy with the radiation. The, the bottom line is that these patients get a lot more chemotherapy. And honestly, I think that where we lose the game with adenocarcinoma is on the systemic disease. And so here we see better um, our zero resection, but then when also we look at disease-free survival and uh, overall survival, this is with just a uh, presented at GI ASCO last week. Um, um, the, uh, our survival is improved when we give this patient more chemotherapy. Uh, so we have really changed a little bit the way we treat adenocarcinomas in this sense. Now, what do we do with a squamous cancer that had what we call a clinical complete response, right? I always have the call from the um, oncologist say, oh, this patient, all disease is gone, had a clinical complete response, which means PET is negative and endoscopy is negative and biopsy are all negative. What do we do with this patient? And often now we have moved to this like only if needed approach for surgery. And uh, we have done a analysis of our own patients and where we compare overall in disease-free survival of those patients that were treated with definitive chemo radiation and those that were treated with three modalities, so chemo radiation and surgery. And you can see here that those patients that had surgery had a better disease-free and overall survival. And when we looked at the details of these uh, patients, really the um, one that were treated only with the uh, definitive chemo radiation had a much higher local recurrence rate. And it's not always easy to uh, salvage them, especially for those tumors that are located in the mid of the esophagus where there is a lot of vital structures around where you can't really always remove the tumor. Uh, so when we did our multi, um, variable analysis, you know, only the addition of surgery was a significant factor uh, to determine survival on these patients. So well, we go back to the case. Uh, so what happened is a little disappointing case because after multiple dilation for uh, this patient dysphagia, uh, eight months later, you can see here endoscopically, we can see some nodules. And a PET-CT now patient seems to have not only uptake in the esophagus, but also uptake into a lymph node uh, around the stomach in the gastropathic ligament. Uh, so at this point, a uh, patient uh, was treated then with a uh, cross regimen. Remember it's a squamous type cancer uh, and uh, underwent carbotaxels and radiation and actually restaging um, uh, showed that the patient had progressed and actually there was a lymph node there uh, higher in the paratracheal, right, paratracheal space that was positive. So as you see, this early stage disease uh, can become an issue if we're not uh, treating them appropriately. A uh, patient had this ophagectomy and the final pathology was a YPT1B and 2. So three lymph nodes were actually positive uh, after, after treatment. So that's the kind of you know outcome you really want to avoid. Here you have a patient with a relatively low risk submucosal lesion, from what we could tell, probably would have been cured with upfront primary esophagectomy, got an esophagectomy anyway, but in the interval, multiple dilatations, chemo radiotherapy, and poor disease at the end of it all. So this is, this is a tragic story of, of early cancer treatment. Right. And patient could not eat throughout all this time. So she was very happy to eat after the esophagectomy. So yeah. poor quality of life too. So let's talk about surgery. Dr. Minister, can you tell us a little bit what options do you use in terms of surgical resection and strategies for these tumors? Sure, we're gonna kind of just uh, keep this brief because I know there's a lot of discussions about things. 
All of these different approaches can be done minimally invasively. And as we know, we're moving more and more towards minimally invasive approaches for the uh, benefits that that offers to the patients. Uh, for tumors below the carina in the mid to distal esophagus, I think the best surgical approach is an en bloc dissection, which involves removing the pleura, the ascus vein, and the thoracic duct. You, you end that extensive dissection at the level of the ascus arch, uh, and there's really no dissection of paratracheal nodes or recurrent lingual nerve nodes. In the abdomen, uh, then you resect the parahiatal, left gastric portahepatous nodes, and the anastomosis can be done in the neck or the chest. Three field dissection for tumors located at the crina or above. Here, you're gonna focus less on the, on the resection distally and more on the resection proximally because many of these nodes now will be in the paratracheal regions or the recurrent lingual nerve and cervical regions. So this then will obligate a careful dissection of those nodes and then typically a neck anastomosis because you need a bit of a margin in these patients with more proximal tumors. Transhidal esophagectomy is, uh, has been around for a long time. It's a very appropriate operation in some patients. It's not a great oncologic operation, but we'll talk about um, the, the uh, lymph node burden and the relationship to the type of resection in a few minutes. But it does allow you to do a good cervical node dissection, abdominal node dissection, but it's pretty limited for the intrathoracic nodal disease. So you may wanna use this because you don't have to collapse the lung. This is obviously a reasonable approach in a very high risk patient or patients that have a prohibitive problem in their chest, prior pneumonectomy or extensive thoracic surgery that may limit your ability to get into the chest uh, safely. And then vagal sparing esophagectomy is used less and less now that we have such good endoscopic approaches a vagal sparing uh, operation was designed by Akiyama from Japan many years ago. We adopted it uh, probably about 15, 20 years ago at USC. And it's useful in patients, number one, with benign disease. So it's a great option if you have to do a esophagectomy for end stage achalasia or reflux disease. But it's also applicable for patients that have limited mucosal disease. So multifocal intramucosal cancers that would be difficult or the patient doesn't want to undergo repeated endoscopic approaches. This is a very nice option. You don't resect any lymph nodes, so it's not appropriate for submucosal or tumors that might go to lymph nodes, but it is a, a very nice option to preserve vagal function and reduce some of the morbidity associated with an esophagectomy. Well, Dr. Molina, what are your thoughts about adjuvant therapy in these patients? How, what do you use and, and what, uh, how long do you use it? You're muted, I can't hear you. Sorry. So this patient that we had uh, uh, you know, showed all the evolution of the course it, uh, a few months ago really wouldn't have had much option for adjuvant. Uh, as you know, all the clinical trials and adjuvant treatment uh, do not show any uh, benefit of adjuvant treatment after chemo radiation and surgery and are, you know, some systemic reviews or uh, NCDB met analysis that show maybe a benefit of chemotherapy. But I think the game changer is uh, this study, uh, Checkmate 577, that was just published, um, uh, that was just discussed actually at ASMO uh, earlier in um, the end of uh, 2020. And uh, this study really showed a difference in survival uh, for patients that had been treated with chemotherapy and radiation, then had surgery, but still with residual disease, either in the esophagus or in any lymph node. And when this patient received nivolumab uh, for a year after uh, treatment, uh, they had a significant uh, disease-free survival improvement. So I think this is a game changer. Uh, we don't know a lot about immunotherapy. You know, there was a question in the chat about this. Uh, we don't know a lot about immunotherapy yet for esophageal cancer, um, especially in the neoadjuvant or adjuvant setting. Uh, we only had a lot of results on uh, metastatic disease, and it seems like squamous cell might be a, a tumor that responds really well to 
um, to immunotherapy. We have several phase one or two trial now looking at immunotherapy as a new adjuvant option. Uh, and um, uh, so we'll see more and more of that use in the future. We, we do have a, a study at Memorial Sloan Academy right now where we're looking at uh, durvalumab with chemo radiation, and we had a, a good response and increased number of uh, complete responders with that treatment. But uh, adjuvant uh, is the key, and, and so now we have an option to give immunotherapy to patients, uh, and that's what this patient will have. Uh, so what do you do with the with patients that have more advanced disease? You're still uh, operating this patient and uh, uh, should surgery be different if you know that patient have more than two or three nodes positive? Yeah, we've got some information on that. And what we've um, what we learned, we put a consortium together of about nine international centers, high volume centers around the world for esophageal surgery. And we put this graph together and these were all primary resections. Nobody had neoadjuvant therapy. So obviously this study was done a number of years ago, but it really gives us the biology of the native disease treated by surgery only. And in over 2000 patients, we put this graph together and this is systemic recurrence plotted by the number of involved lymph nodes. And what you see is if you're in the N1 range, one or two lymph nodes, the likelihood of systemic disease is below 50%. And many of these patients were cured with just surgery. As you climb up into the N2 disease range, then the risk of systemic disease exceeds 50%. And by time you're at N3, uh, essentially 100% of patients will ultimately succumb to systemic recurrence. So what we're realizing is that a high nodal burden equates to systemic spread of the disease. So when we approach that with surgery, we have to realize that if they have N3 disease, we're not gonna cure them with surgical resection. So the role of surgery is to control the local esophageal disease. And another question we then asked, well, what, if you're just trying to control the local disease, does this type of surgery matter? And what we found is that it really doesn't. A simple resection minimizes the morbidity and mortality and does not change the likelihood of survival. And, this is our paper back in 2004 that showed that when you had limited nodal disease, one to eight lymph nodes, primary surgical resection, the outcome was much better with the on-block resection compared to a transhidal where you really focused on getting a good oncologic operation. But when there was nine or more lymph nodes, these N3 patients type of surgery made no difference in their survival. And this study was confirmed in a randomized controlled trial out of the Netherlands, showing the same thing for limited nodal disease, extensive oncologic surgery makes sense. With more advanced nodal disease, really the role of surgery is to take the esophagus out. You're not going to change the outcome based on the oncologic extent of your operation. Well, Dr. Molina, do you think surgery is ever a consideration in patients with systemic disease? Well, I think that uh, we have a lot to learn about this, and uh, there are a ton of uh, small series and uh, single institution uh, reports about uh, successful resection on metastasis. But really, the better data that we have is on adenocarcinoma with a FLOT3 trial uh, that uh, really looked at surgery in a very, very selected group of patients uh, with limited metastatic disease, what we call oligometastatic disease. So only a few sites of metastatic disease. And if those patients had a good response to chemotherapy first, so first control the systemic uh, spread of the disease. And then if they remain just oligometastatic, then removing that tumor might actually benefit their survival. And this is especially true for neural disease uh, or for limited metastatic sites like lung, um, less so for liver or for peritoneal disease. But so there is a larger trial now going on, um, FLOT5, that will, will look specifically at that. And uh, so I, I think that is something that we need to make some progress in esophageal cancer. And perhaps there are some patients that would benefit from uh, surgery for metastatic disease. 
So to conclude, the treatment of esophageal cancer has really evolved over the years, and we now can better tailor our approach to the histology and stage of the disease. For early stage cancers, the really key factors are the depth of invasion and the presence or absence of the risk factors that are associated with lymph node metastases. Endoscopic resection is the starting point, and it gives you the information you need to make a informed decision with the patient about the best options. Local regionally advanced lesions are best treated with combination therapy, either chemo surgery, chemo radiation surgery, varied by histology a little bit and tumor location. And patients with advanced uh, extensive nodal disease or systemic disease may be candidates for surgery, but we got to recognize that as surgeons, our role here is quite limited because it's the systemic disease that is critical to get under control to impact survival in these patients. So I think we wanted to stop at this point and thank all of you so much for, um, for your attention. And uh, I don't know how we're handling questions, but if there are questions or issues that we can address, we're certainly happy to, to uh, address those. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was fun. Uh, thank you very much for your very nice presentation, Professor Melina and Professor Dimester. Very nice to meet you. And I hope so. I will see you in the next, inshallah, uh, webinar for next year. Thank you very much. Uh, I, 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 I saw a, a question from Professor Haybo about uh, immunotherapy for the locally advanced disease. And you should you mention also in the in the your presentation. Do you do you want to add something? Yeah. So um, thank you, uh, Judge Haibusan. Uh, it's nice that, that you're there. Uh, the um, so yeah, as I said before, I think there's a lot of learning so we have to do, but it it, it could potentially be a game changer. Uh, we um, looked at uh, CPS expression. Uh, it seems like when we have higher CPS expression, patients will respond better uh, to immunotherapy. Um, but in this uh, Checkmate 577, every, every patient with residual disease did, did better, even when they're PDL1. They look at PDL1 rather than CPS. But even those with PDL1 less than one uh, did, uh, did better than patients on placebo. So I think that is a therapy that we'll use more and more in the future, uh, but we'll need some clinical trial to identify the group of patients will benefit most of them. Thank you. Uh, is there any, uh, I suppose there is another question. Uh, let me check because right now I saw it. Um, Uh, the question is that, is the gold standard surgical thing as a curative procedure? What is the gold standard surgical technique as a curative procedure? Well, I think the gold standard as a curative procedure is a very good oncologic operation. And uh, depends where the tumor is located, but you must address the regional nodes for that particular tumor and location. So <clears throat> if it's a mid or higher squamous tumor, then you need to address the paratracheal and recurrential nerves and the cervical nodes. For distal adenocarcinomas, there had been in the past quite a bit of dispute about the need for uh, three field dissection, cervical node dissection, and Tony LaRoute from Belgium was a big proponent of cervical lymphadenectomy, even with distal esophageal cancers. But for most of us in the United States, we've realized that the risk of cervical nodes is pretty small and we're comfortable watching the neck and not doing cervical node dissection for distal adenocarcinomas, but importantly, a very extensive dissection from the azagous arch downward. So it depends. I think, you know, the, we as surgeons absolutely can uh, bring survival to patients by our operation but we have to take it seriously and make sure we address the important lymph nodes or we compromise our chance for a cure in these patients. And thank you very much. And thank you for uh, on-time presentation. Uh, so we go for the next lecture. The lecture title is Tips and Ticks uh, for Esophagectomy in Prone Position 
by bon Professor Bonavia, is a professor at the University of Milan Medical School, Director of Division of General and Forgot Surgery. Professor Bonavia. Hello, can you hear me? Now, of course. Okay, can you see me? I don't think so, but it's not important. I'll try to do. Please, uh, turn the video, please. <clears throat> Okay, can you see the screen? Can you see my slides? No. I'll try to share, okay. Oh, okay, right now as we, we see your PowerPoint slide. Sorry, just a second. We have some technical problems here. Okay. Start video. No, sembra mi nascondo. It's okay right now. Ti vediamo Luigi. <laughs> sì, but I'm not able to share my No, you're sharing. We can see you. Video? Yes. Okay, you don't see me probably, but it's not important you hear my voice. Uh, thanks. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, international uh, panel. Uh, thank you, to, uh, Professor Mamuzae, for uh, your moderation and invitation. I see many friends here, and uh, Daniela and uh, my friend uh, Steve, the mister. So we were asked to talk about uh, uh, tips and tricks for esophagectomy in the prone position. And um, uh, I want to, to tell you that uh, due to a, a, an emergency case, I will uh, introduce the, the, this topic and then I will leave my uh, close co-worker, Professor Emanuele Asti, who will uh, go through the, the topic in details. So the background is that esophagectomy is a current standard of care for patients with the localized esophageal cancer. We heard about, we had this very nice debate between Daniela and Steve. Uh, we know that uh, a shift to high volume centers has decreased mortality from 8% to 4%. So we must say that surgery is a very safe uh, procedure nowadays. And further, a minimally invasive esophagectomy has shown the potential to further reduce morbidity, especially respiratory complications, and uh, therefore increase uh, uh, referrals to uh, surgery. Now, uh, just a, a small historical background. Uh, uh, curiously, prontoracoscopy was the real first minimally invasive approach for esophagectomy. And the Professor Kusheri from Dundee uh, uh, de uh, described this first uh, back in 1992. Too, just at the beginning of the minimally invasive uh, uh, era of uh, minimal invasive surgery. Uh, three years later, a Brazilian colleague uh, uh, showed that the feasibility of esophagectomy through a pure laparoscopic transaital approach. Few years later, Lukatic in the States uh, promoted the left lateral thoracoscopy and uh, in 2006, uh, prontoracoscopy was uh, revisited again by Dr. Palanivelu from India. Uh, we, uh, our, uh, our experience most 
most recent experience with the esophagectomy started uh, uh, back in 2006 when we uh, used to, you, you see here from this graph an increase, uh, we maintain the hybrid Ivor Lewis approach because as you know, in, uh, in Western Europe, in Italy, adenocarcinoma is the most common uh, histotype. So we think that doing an anastomosis in the uh, high uh, mediastinum is still the approach of choice. But also in 2006, we started doing the uh, thoracoscopic first approach with the neck anastomosis. And we compare those two um, techniques. The thoracoscopic prone position, in our opinion, has uh, the advantage of being more physiological uh, for the, for the uh, patient and also more ergonomic for the surgeon. You see that uh, in, the, in this position, uh, there is no pressure on the uh, abdominal uh, wall. So uh, there is a preservation of, uh, of uh, lung function that uh, uh, allows uh, um, to um, reduce postoperative respiratory complication. And when uh, uh, having a too long ventilation, this means that you uh, intermittently can ventilate the left lung. This is uh, different than the left side thoracoscopy. And then you conclude the operation with a neck anastomosis. Uh, further, uh, we develop and really no, uh, we, we adopted the thoracoscopic semi-prone position that in our opinion as uh, 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 added advantages compared to the prone. So the benefits are the same for the patient and for the surgeon, but in this semi-prone position, you can easily perform, to, you can easily switch to thoracotomy if necessary, if and the, this is feasible by just uh, tilting the table. The anesthesiologist is more comfortable because he can better control the orotracheal tube. And also, if you need to do an intraoperative endoscopy, this provides access to the mouth compared to the prone position. So this is just a short introduction. I will be back in a while, but in the meantime, uh, Emanuele Asti will present our tips and tricks for prone and semi-prone esophagectomy. Emanuele, are yes, you ready? I'm, yes, I'm here. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for hosting me here. Thank you for everybody. Uh, well, I can start sharing yeah. my presentation. OK, here we are. So uh, this ophagectomy is a technically uh, challenging uh, uh, operation procedure, which requires advanced skills in abdominal and thoracic uh, surgery also. So critical surgical steps should be carefully respected to perform a safe operation. And for completeness, I will analyze the minimal invasive I will use of esophagectomy with the, the challenge of the intrathoracic anastomosis. Uh, for uh, the presentation, I divided the procedure in 10 steps, four steps uh, in uh, laparoscopy and six steps in thoracoscopy. So now we start focus on the abdominal part. The patient uh, is supine in a reverse trendelenburg position. The pneumoperitoneum is uh, induced with a verse needle. Uh, and we usually place five standard uh, setup, five uh, ports in a typical upper GI setup with the three 12 millimeter trockers and two five millimeter trockers. 
And we always start with a diagnostic laparoscopy and a careful check of the gastric uh, wall and potential involvement uh, of the abdominal nodes. We see here that we start with a yatal dissection. Sometimes you can find very huge tumors that are the, the, with the distortion of the normal anatomy. So uh, the gastrohepatic, uh, after the gastrohepatic uh, is uh, opened, we start with the opening of the hiatus, you can see here. And uh, also we dissect the posterior wall of the esophagus because the one of the first step of this type of surgery is to encircle the esophagus with uh, usually we place a tape or a easy flow like this that is closed with the with the hemolock and then we pass to to dissect the mediastinum in order to establish if there is uh, the resectability of the lesion. You can see here the right pleura. It's important for, uh, in our opinion, uh, avoid uh, the opening of the, of the pleura if it's possible, because uh, it's important uh, because it will result in the worsening of the respiratory functions. And also it can give a distress, a sort of dissenary uh, this synergic uh, transition of the of the um, of the diaphragm that uh, can also uh, worsening our operation in the in the abdomen. And uh, one of the pitfall is uh, as we see, we have seen the mediastinal dissection. It's important to avoid pleural opening. And if it happens, it can be useful to place a gauze and reduce, and reduce also the pressure of the pneumoperitoneum. And second one, uh, it's uh, always um, important to use a mastactic device during the dissection of the periesophageal uh, wall around uh, uh, and in the closed part to the aorta, uh, because we know that uh, we have a lot of uh, arteries that comes from the aorta feeding the esophagus. So this is the video with the in a, that represents a case where was opened accidentally the pleura. You can see here. So we continue the dissection. As many patients have had radiation treatment, the dissection planes may, mm, between the periesophageal tissue and the pleura are often obliterated. So uh, inadvertent pleurotomies will result in a floppy diaphragm and uh, that uh, can be very bothersome for the rest of the procedure. So uh, in this case can be useful to reduce the level of the pneumoperitoneum and place a uh, goes a swab inside of the mediastinum in order to reduce uh, the distress, respiratory distress. After that, you can see the use of hemostatic device during the periaortic esophageal dissection. Uh, we know that the blood supply comes directly from the aorta and it's important during this dissection to achieve a perfect hemostasis during this dissection. You can see here the left, left pleura. Okay. So one of the most important part of the operation is the mobilization of the stomach. It's important uh, during the section, during the opening of the gastrocolonic uh, ligament to prevent any damage uh, to the gastrodiploic arcade. And uh, I always remember to the resident that there is a no touching area in the stomach that is the part of the stomach that we need for the reconstruction. So I always say to the, to the, to the assistant, uh, the minimal grasping of the stomach that is very important is a common criticism of the minimal invasive esophagectomy because uh, if we use an aggressive grasper manipulation, it can lead to a beaten up conduit with a significant micro microvascular trauma. And this may lead to leak and or eventually a uh, vascular ischemia. Uh, to avoid these, we usually we, we use the endopenuts just to push and pull the, the stomach away and to perform the complete mobilization of the stomach. 
And again, we also perform the pylorus test. That uh, it's it, it uh, it's a test where where we place we we catch the pylorus and we 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 push it close to the right pillar. Now you can see here the, the because the operation is going on. This is the the section of the left gastric vessels. Usually we divide these vessels uh, using uh, uh, the emolock, the clips. Sometimes if you have a bulky region with some nodes or something like that, or stuff like that, it can be useful also to use a vascular load. Otherwise, we usually replace two or three uh, clips like this. It's an easy case just for uh, presentation. And we continue the dissection, or completing a formal D2 lymphodenectomy. And then we can see here that we divide the lesser curvature vessels here, just opening the view in the retrogastric cavity. We can see here that we divide also the gastrocolonic uh, ligament uh, going marching up to the to the pylorus and then it's important to avoid any grasping of the no touch zone no touch area remember this it's very important and you can see here the that the, the stomach is pushed away and we march up to the spleen with the dissection using uh, ultrasonic scalpel it's another another tricky is a tricky region is the dissection close to the to the right vessels the, here we can see the pylorus test the pylorus is here and the right pillar is there we can see that the the stomach is completely freed so uh, another another pitfall is the creation of the gastric conduit it's important to maintain a consistent width of the stomach, about four centimeters. How we can do that using the laparoscopic forceps as a reference. It's important, it's just a little, a little tip. And uh, it's important also to avoid spiralization of the gastric tube. It's important to check every time before uh, stapling to check the wall in front and rear and keep the stomach tense in order to avoid the zigzag suture. And how long the gastric conduit is, it's, uh, sometimes it's difficult to, to clearly understand how much is long our conduit. So uh, we, we, uh, we consider that it is useful to place a stitch in each uh, intersection of the step on line and there is also important step, in particularly during the minimal invasive esophagectomy, where to place the anastomosis. It's, uh, in my opinion, in our opinion, important, interesting to place a stitch in the upper part of the stomach, in the apex of the fundus, that will be a sort of landmark to recognize the, the, the real position of the, of the um, anastomosis. It would be just a little tricky in the thoracic part. And if, if we have in some selected cases, sometimes, uh, well, for example, for patient that uh, has some vascular abnormality to the, um, to arc, to the vascular arcade, or in some cases with just a little bit of tricky during the section, or in patient that received a large amount of radiotherapy or chemo radiotherapy, uh, it can be useful to uh, to, to give to the patient infusion about five milliliters of endogen and green, and then check the perfusion with the fluorescence. Uh, you can see here all these steps. This is the, the, the first step for the gastric conduit fashioning. Usually we place two stitches uh, about uh, at the third branch of the ra right gastric uh, uh, artery, we place two stitches that are very useful to, 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 to give traction 
and to present uh, uh, the stomach to the staple. You can see here the 45 millimeters. Usually we use a purple uh, load. Sometimes you can use also a black one if the, the stomach is particularly thick. And we continue usually with two staple line, 45 millimeters, always uh, purple. You can see here that Tahawa are typical stores, uh, forceps is about four centimeters, four centimeters. So it's just to remark the right dimension, wide of the gastric conduit. And then we continue to 45 parallel to the gastric uh, large curvature. It's important to to pull down the stomach in order to, you can see here that the, the assistant pulled down the stomach in order to straight up the stomach and the, and the um, suture will be in the right position in order to avoid zigzag suturing. And also I can say that it's very important to go farther and farther up in the stomach because uh, you can see here also just a little mistake. It's important to see also um, behind. Otherwise, you can, in this case, we can perform a mistake. You can see it was uh, intrepid to just uh, um, omentum inside. It's important to go in the upper part of the stomach because in the in the chest will be just a little bit tricky to, to, to divide the stomach. So we continue here, you can see placing the stitch in the upper part of the fundus and uh, some and uh, a stitch in each intersection line of the staple line, you can see. So at the end, we can check how many stitch we place. So this is the number of load that we use. So it's useful in this thoracic part. You can see there. Carry on. Uh, to prevent diaphragmatic hernia, a posterior suture of the crura is placed and the left temporarily untied into the lower mediastinum. You can see in the following video. This is done because in our case here, we have a, a small number, a large number of long-term survivors, but a small patients, a small amount of patients with the complaining of symptoms suggestive of conduit compression. This was due uh, to uh, what we found with the imaging that sometimes this patient had the herniation of the typically transverse colon in the hiatus. And we think that the closure is with a stitch uh, during, uh, done during the, um, this time of surgery can be useful to prevent the slippage of the colon. And uh, the closure of the stitch is done, as you can see, uh, in the thoracic part. And uh, it's important to remember that the closure should be snug enough to prevent herniation, but not too tight. And it's important also to place uh, a chest drain that is uh, painless. So we introduced this type of uh, drain that is placed in the mediastinum through the uh, upper port, the subxiphoid port, and then through the diaphragm, and then in the mediastinum and in the uh, left, in the right uh, uh, chest. You can see here the video. This was a patient with uh, just a little bit uh, tight uh, hiatus uh, defect. So we enlarged, but we decided also to place a stitch, as we said before, that uh, was leave untied. We place this stitch in a reverse uh, manner because it will be closed in the after the, the, the thoracic part of the operation is, is ended. So we can see that uh, he, an emolock is placed in the tip of the two uh, of the of this stitch and is pushed up in the chest. And also important to place this type, in our opinion, this type of uh, of uh, chest drain that is very 
low pain uh, drain is placed using the subxified port. So now we have to uh, to um, to introduce the thoracic part. The change of the position can be just a little bit time consuming procedure. So it's important uh, in our opinion to train the nurse staff uh, on the right procedure and but it can take 10, 15 minutes. Uh, personally, I lack very much the semi prone position for its versatility. The patient can easily be tilted for, from a semi prone to prone or lateral position as we need, for example, in cases of bleeding and uh, to, 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 to convert in open, uh, in open surgery. So this is the, the, the was, what was, um, uh, I'm sorry, Professor, you have two minutes to go. This is the, the, the position of the patient. The pneumothorax is induced with the verse needed in the, in the posterior axillary line. And the trockers are placed in four, six, and eight intercostal space. So uh, this is the typical setup for the uh, thoracic part of the operation. Usually we place on the right side uh, five millimeter trockers because the intercostal space in the upper part of the chest is just a little bit narrow. So it's much more easy to move uh, five than a 12. And the other two port are 12 millimeter trocker. And uh, in the, the second part of thoracic uh, dissection, we enlarge the lower most trocker uh, uh, because we need uh, just a mini trochotomy in order to, to introduce the circular stapler. As you can see here, we also insert a wound retractor device and then uh, for continuing to maintain the pneumoperitoneum, we introduce the use of the of a glove uh, and inside one finger we place the circular stapler or other uh, device that we need. So the esophageal dissection thoracic part uh, just uh, simple in the two in the two in the two thirds uh, in the lower two thirds uh, eastern two thirds of the esophagus just a little bit of trick in the upper third the esophagus uh, should be encircled with a tape and then traction it and it's important in our opinion also to preserve the branchial branch of the bugger trunk in order to uh, to, to preserve the reflex of the cough and the post-operative uh, curse. You can see here the, the dissection of the esophagus is uh, quite simple, close to the pericardium and upper, close uh, to the azygous vein, cross of the azygous veins, the parallel dissection. Again, we can see here that the use of a morning scalpel for this section in the plane close to the order, because there are a lot of uh, tricky vessels here. So we continue just now. You can see the counterlateral pleura, the left pleura. And just you can see here that, that we place a tape around for encircling the esophagus. This tape is placed and is secured with the endo loop. And this endo loop is then, as you can see here, is tractioned by an uh, endo close that is passed through an intercostal space. And it's, uh, it's helpful to avoid the placement of another port. So in order to reduce uh, pain for the patient, you can see here that the traction is very good. You can see here also the dissection of the azygous vein. It's important to dissect. You can see also here the uh, branchial artery down to the cross of the azygous vein dissection. It's important not to leave a long stamp of the azygous vein in order to prevent the coagulation and risky for, uh, for uh, thromboembolism. So dissection continue very easily using also this traction method. And again, subcranial lymphadenectomy, carina thermal damage to your energy device, it's just important uh, pitfall to consider. So 
The harmonic scalpel can easily result in injury of the membranous part of the trachea and bronchae portion and, and then all the airways. So it's also not only from direct uh, injury, but also from thermal spread of the energy. So it's also to be considered that the, the subcarina space can be very vascular. So sometimes it's hard to avoid the use of this type of device. Uh, dear professor, you are behind the time. Uh, yeah. may you, thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Sorry about that. So you can see here the subcarinal lymphadenectomy and bronchial branch preservation. You can see the dissection of the subcarinal lymph nodes placed inside of a, of a finger just for removal. And you can see, and uh, just a nice this part of the video, we can see the dissection close to the in the subcarinal space. Just this is the uh, vagal trunk. And here we can clearly see now the bronchial branch that comes from the vagus nerve. That is important here, vagal trunk and bronchial branch. It's important to preserve the bronchial branch. And it's important also to remove all nodes in this area, also um, for adenocarcinoma. This patient had the adenocarcinoma of the distal esophagus. In case of um, mid part of esophageal carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, it's also important to, to dissect the upper part uh, of the mediastinum, the recurrential nodes, uh, and so on. Okay, again, chest delegation. If the anatomy is difficult, it's possible to use a suture trap for traction to achieve easier and safer duct ligation. We can see G just this short video. Uh, in this patient, yes, it was uh, quite easy to reach the, the place where to, to tie the, the duct. So just an opening in the, in the um, pleura and the section from the azygous vein, and then the section continue close to the aorta. Very just, you know, it's, it's a slow motion video. And you can see here the duct that is encircled. And then we pass, uh, we encircle the duct, and this tissue is a uh, fat tissue with a uh, thread, uh, just for traction. And this is also useful for placing the emolock the clip uh, just to be sure to catch all the tissue that uh, is included in this part and also the duct so uh, assess the, the upper margin of the tumor sometimes is difficult because if the tumor is small and not palpable uh, can be used for the day before surgery to perform an, an endoscopy with the positioning of a clip in the upper part of the of the cancer and in the interoperative uh, uh, course we can use ultrasound just to check in the upper part of the lesion just to check the presence of the clip and just to be sure that the the the, the lesion is is in is in the, that place in the case, for example, that we, we had the, the lesion is very high and so on. So uh, the gastric conduit pull up, it's very important to avoid any traumatic grasping of the conduit and check the complete transposition. And uh, as we can see in this video, the stitches that we placed before in the, in the abdominal part of the operation can be very, very useful. It's important, this is, this is more, this is more curvature that was dissected, it can be uh, can be pulled up, it's pulled up also uh, in the part of the esophagus. It's important to avoid any touching in the part of the stomach or the conduit that will be used for the uh, for the anastomosis. So you can see here the the stitch that we place in the apex of the gastric conduit. You can see here the surgeon avoids any touching of the gastric conduit. You can see the suture oh. line. So your line should be uh, close to us and the vascular part. Uh, excuse me, Professor, we have no time. Yeah. Okay, I go fast as they can. Okay. Um, 
upper esophageal dissection, avoid energy device for esophageal, esophageal tracheal dissection, prefer blunt dissection in case of upper part of the esophageal dissection. You can see here, it's very important to avoid energy use and pass through. Interthoracic anastomosis, that is the topic. Uh, you can perform side-to-side -side circular anastomosis with a pushed anvil or a transoral anastomosis uh, with an orbital. In the first uh, technique, we perform a uh, esophagotomy just to place inside the anvil. Uh, the anvil is also connected with a 10 centimeters uh, suture that we can that that is introduced through the mini thoracotomy. We that this is the mini thoracotomy. The anvil is pushed up in the esophagus, in the upper part of the esophagus, and then the stitch that is uh, connected is passed from inside to outside. And then, when it completed, we divide uh, below the anvil with a uh, purple load. We divide the esophagus. And then we pull a gentle pull the, 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 the anvil outside of the esophageal stump. And then we perform the anastomosis. This is the placement of the circular stapler. Okay, connection and anastomosis and the last one and the last one this is the orbital system for the anastomosis this is the esophageal stump this is the tube the tube that is pushed by the anesthesiologist down is connected to the anvil and now we cut the blue uh, the blue stitch in order to free the, the anvil and then again the circular stapler is connected to the to the anvil and the anastomosis is completed. Usually our patients are extubated in the OR, are transferred to ICU for just for um, check. And we can perform aspiration of the nasogastric tube for the first 24, 48 hours. Uh, it's important the pain management and in post-operative day one, the patient is allowed to work and respiratory physiotherapy is important too. Post-operative day three, the patient is allowed to drink water sips and diet is gradually advanced and usually perform a gas graphene swallow well study in post-operative day five. Thank you very much. Sorry for the late. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. It was a very nice presentation. And I was very interested in your video, and uh, but uh, because of the shortage of time, I had to start the new the uh, the, the next lecture. Uh, I have question. Uh, I try to uh, I give the answer to the question in the next lecture. Uh, so the next lecture is the lymphadenectomy minimally invasive surgery by Professor Haybus San. Department of Thoracic Surgery, Henan Center Hospital. As I know, the Henan Center is the biggest center for esophageal cancer in China. Professor, I'm at your service. Okay, you thank you. you. Can you hear me? Yeah, of course. Okay. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Sun from Henan Cancer Hospital. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Mamazide for inviting me to attend this international meeting. And uh, I'm very happy that I meet Dr. Molina and Dr. Demister and all other uh, international experts in the field of esophageal cancer treatment. So thank you very much. My topic today is about lymph nodes dissection in minimally invasive esophagectomy. Uh, it was my great uh, honor to visit Gorgon in May 9, 2019, and I had a very happy time there. And uh, 
uh, I was impressed that uh, Iranian colleagues all worked very hard in the field of esophageal cancer treatment. And uh, I believe that the work you have done will improve the treatment for esophageal cancer. Uh, today, I would like to talk about uh, three topics. The first is the history of uh, surgical treatment for esophageal cancer. Then I would like to talk about uh, the lymphatic drainage of the esophagus. And uh, finally, I, I will show you some videos about the lymph nodes dissection in minimally invasive esophagectomy. Uh, this is the geographical distribution of the incidence of esophageal cancer around the world. And as you can see that China is one of the countries uh, with the highest incidence of esophageal cancer. Well, in China, the different provinces uh, have very different incidence of esophageal uh, cancer also. In Henan province, uh, Henan province is one of the provinces with the highest incidence of esophageal cancer in China. And uh, our hospital was founded in 2017 uh, just uh, because of the fighting of esophageal cancer. Then I would like to give a quick review of the surgical treatment for esophageal cancer. Uh, as Dr. Mamozad mentioned, uh, Dr. Franz Torek in 1930 performed the first uh, successful left thoracotomy esophagectomy for esophageal cancer. And uh, after that, a lot of pioneers contributed to the improvement of surgical treatment for esophageal cancer. In uh, 1945, Dr. Sweet from MDH improved the surgical, surgical treatment in left thoracotomy esophagectomy. And in 1946, Dr. Ever Lewis from UK improved the surgical techniques in red thoracotomy, subjectomy. And this procedure is still very popular around the world. And uh, uh, Dr. Andrew Logan, also from UK, improved the surgical techniques for N-block subjectomy. Uh, in Asia, especially in Japan, surgeons focused more about uh, lymph nodes dissection in the surgical treatment for esophageal cancer. Uh, in 1980s, Dr. Akiyama reported his studies in three-field lymph nodes dissection for esophageal cancer. And after that, three-field lymph, lymph nodes dissection is a standard procedure in Japan. In 1984, Dr. Oringer from University of Michigan improved the surgical treatment uh, surgical techniques in transhiatal esophagectomy. And uh, in 1990s, Dr. Lukitic from Pittsburgh improved the minimally invasive esophagectomy techniques. And today, minimally invasive esophagectomy is a standard treatment in many medical centers in China. Then I would like to talk about the anatomy of, of lymph nodes uh, lymph lymphatic drainage of the esophagus. Uh, why sh should we perform the lymph nodes dissection during the uh, procedure of esophagectomy? I think uh, I think uh, the most importantly, uh, firstly, the more lymph nodes we dissect during the operation, the more accurate pathologic end stage we can have we can have, and it is very important to get the post-operative adjuvant therapy and to provide, pre predict uh, patient's prognosis. And secondly, the aim to dissect uh, more lymph nodes is to improve patient's prognosis, although the, it is a very controversial issue, but uh, many previous studies showed that increased the lymph nodes dissection could improve patient's prognosis. Well, for patients with esophageal cancer, lymph nodes metastasis is a very early uh, event. And uh, previous studies show that 
the incidence of lymph nodes metastasis is, a, is more than 20% for patients even with a T1B disease. And this is why we should pay much more attention to lymph nodes dissection for esophageal cancer. In our traditional knowledge, for esophageal cancer lymph nodes metastasis, it starts from the paraesophagus and then to the retinal, then to the retinal area, and then to the distant lymph nodes. But this understanding is not correct. Then let's see the anatomy of lymphatic drainage of the esophagus. Submucosal lymph vessels of the esophagus extend caudally, uh, that is the left gastric artery lymph nodes, and cranially, that is the recurrent laryngeal nerve lymph nodes. Uh, Periesophageal lymph nodes communicate with intramuscular lymph vessels, and the communication between the submucosal lymph vessels and the intramuscular lymph vessels is rare. So when a tumor invades submucosal layer, it more likely metastasizes to uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve lymph nodes and the left gastric lymph nodes, but not paraesophagus lymph nodes. And when the tumor invades the muscular layer of the esophagus, the paraesophageal lymph nodes metastasis will happen. The definition of lymph was identified in 1995 by ISDE. Uh, if we dissect the lymph nodes below subcranial area and abdominal area, it is named as the standard two field lymph And if we aid the right recurrent laryngeal nerve lymph nodes, it is named as the extended two field lymph nodes uh, dissection. And if we aid the left recurrent laryngeal nerve lymph nodes, then it is named the total two field lymph lymphadenectomy. And uh, based on total two field lymph nodes dissection, if we aid the cervical lymph nodes dissection, it is named as the three field lymph nodes dissection. In 1993, Dr. Akiyama reported his study about uh, three field lymphadenectomy for patients with esophageal cancer. The results showed that uh, no matter the location of the tumor, the instance of a cervical uh, lymph nodes metastasis was more than 20%. And in our, in our cancer center, total two field lymphadenectomy is a standard. Uh, we only perform the three field lymphadenectomy for patients with uh, cervical lymph nodes metastasis in, in preoperative staging examination. We analyzed our data for total two-field lymphadenectomy for esophageal cancer, and we found that the highest instance of lymph nodes metastasis is bilateral recurrent laryngeal lymph nodes, uh, lymph nodes. and uh, more than 25% uh, of patients with esophageal cancer have recurrent laryngeal nerve lymph nodes metastasis. So during the operation, we should pay much more attention to lymph nodes dissection in this area. Then I would like to show you some short videos about the lymph nodes dissection in minimally invasive esophagectomy. And for red recurrent laryngeal nerve lymph nodes dissection, uh, well, for the thoracic procedure, I think patients, uh, uh, the bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve lymph nodes dissection is the most important part and it is the most difficult part uh, because the space is very narrow. And uh, during the operation, you have to pay, pay mo more attention not to injure the recurrent laryngeal nerve because the injury of the recurrent laryngeal nerve will lead to other postoperative complications like uh, postoperative aspiration and so on. And for the thoracic procedure, we 
put the patient in a semi-prone position and use the artificial pneumothorax. And uh, uh, we put four ports on the right chest wall. The camera is in the seventh intercostal space. The operator's trocars are in the sixth and in the fourth intercostal space. And uh, the assistance is in the, the trocar is in the ninth intercostal space. Well, for the red recurrent laryngeal lymph nodes dissection, we usually we open the upper mediastinal pleural and find the vagus nerve. Then we uh, find the red recurrent laryngeal nerve just uh, be, uh, below the subcranial, uh, subcl subclavicle artery. Then this is the video about uh, right recurrent laryngeal nerve lymph nodes dissection. Firstly, we open the upper mediastinal pleural and find the vagus nerve. You can use the energy to cut the sh very small vessels. And this is the lymph nodes of the red recurrent learned nerve. Then we identify the red recurrent learned nerve. As you can see here, this is the red recurrent learned nerve. After identifying the right recurrent laryngeal nerve, and we use the energy to dissect the lymph nodes in this area. And you can see here, this is the right inferior thyroid artery, and this is the upper borderline for the right recurrent laryngeal nerve lymph nodes dissection. When you push the lymph nodes to the esophagus side, and it is easy to dissect the lymph nodes from the esophagus. And for the left recurrent laryngeal nerve lymph nodes dissection, we divide it into two parts. The first part is the uh, lymph nodes dissection above the aortic arch. And the second part is the lymph nodes dissection just below the aortic arch. And I think during the thoracic procedure, the left recurrent laryngeal nerve lymph nodes dissection is the most uh, important, most difficult, and the most time-consuming part of the uh, operation because the space is very narrow. And firstly, we pull the esophagus to the anterior side and to show the surgical area. And the assistant will help to push the trachea to explore the surgical area. Usually we use a cautery hook to open this space, but you have to pay attention not to injure the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. As you can see here, this is the lymph nodes just along the left recurrent laryngeal nerve.
in the area just distant to the recurrent Lorentzian nerve, we can use the energy. This is this video shows the lymph nodes dissection in just below the aortic arch. And uh, firstly, we just open the space just uh, above the left main bronchus. Then we identify the origin of the left re recurrent laryngeal nerve just uh, below the aortic arch. And you should be careful here because as you can see here, this is the left main pulmonary artery. Uh, if you, the, the cautery hook is deep, it will injure the left main uh, pulmonary artery. And as you can see here, it is very clear that this is the aorta, the left vigorous, and the left main pulmonary artery, the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, and that they see the left main bronchus. Well, for the subcranial lymph nodes dissection, I think it is uh, uh, relatively easy uh, compared with the uh, bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve lymph nodes dissection. Usually, we just open the space just below the, left, uh, the right main bronchus and we dissect the lymph nodes towards the left main bronchus. And this is the video. And uh, firstly, we just open the Chloral just below the right main bronchus. And then we use the harmonic scalpel to dissect the lymph nodes. It's really astonishing surgery. Thank you. And sometimes you may see some uh, art, uh, bronchus artery just uh, below the subcranial area, but it's okay if you use the ultrasound scalpel to dissect the bronchial artery. And this is the lymph nodes just uh, below the left main bronchus. Then we finished the lymph nodes dissection just in the subcranial area. And okay, that's all I want to sh share with you today. And uh, you are very welcome to come to our hospital to have a visit. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, I was impressed by the video. Also, 
before I saw your procedure, and again, I enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, so, Thank you. because we are behind the time, I start the uh, next lecture by uh, Professor Fontaine. The title is Tips and Tricks for Esophagectomy in Duquitus Procedure. Professor, we are at your service. Good morning. I appreciate the invitation. It's an honor to be with you. I have to say that uh, I had the opportunity to come and visit you in Tehran for this uh, symposium in 2015. And now the times make it that we have to do it virtually. So uh, we must adapt. So here we go. Can you hear me and can you see my screen? Could we you? hear you, but the, the quality of the voice is not good as uh, we expected. Okay, I will, uh, <clears throat> I will speak louder and uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, of course. So you can see the video. Okay, very good. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I will be speaking about our experience here at Moffitt Cancer Center. The majority of patients that we see have distal esophageal or G-junction tumors. And most of the time, as you know, adenocarcinomas, which makes it that the majority of our resections may be slightly different than uh, what Professor Sun uh, showed in terms of the lymphadenectomy. So this is a very typical case of a distal esophageal adenocarcinoma. It was locally advanced with some subcranial lymph nodes. We stage our patients with CT scans as well as PET scans and with an EUS. This patient had a T3N1 lesion with positive subcranial lymph nodes. As Professor Asti uh, mentioned, we do place fiducials and uh, so small metallic markers at the proximal end of the tumor. And that's really to help guide not only to tell where the original tumor was at the time of the surgery, but also to guide for radiation therapy. So in terms of neoadjuvant therapy, we give neoadjuvant therapy for T2, N0, and above uh, for all these patients that can tolerate neoadjuvant therapy. We usually give them, although there are different protocols, we don't follow the cross protocol at Moffitt. We give cisplatin with infusional 5-FU, and we give uh, intensely modulated radiation therapy. We give 50.4 gray to the tumor itself. It's gated for respiration using a 4D PET scan. And uh, we dose paint the tumor, just the tumor itself to 56 gray. One question I would have to the panel for a later discussion would be, if seeing that there's several patients or a significant percentage of patients who have lymph node metastases in the cervical areas was nicely illustrated with uh, uh, from Dr. Sons, does the radiation go all the way up to the cervical area as well? Uh, and are you able to do that with low morbidity? So on, what we do is we just target the tumor uh, and the regional lymph nodes, but not the cervical lymph nodes when we're treating G-junction tumors, which is the majority of our patients. Uh, we usually restage the patients with another PET scan, and we usually do it about four to eight weeks after completion of chemo radiation. And as long as there's no evidence of tumor progression or metastatic disease, we offer them surgical resection. So here's this patient that was restaged and there's still some minor FDG avidity in the subcranial lymph node. Uh, it was nicely illustrated by Dr. Sun, the history of, esophage of esophagectomy. We usually perform the Ivor Lewis, a minimally invasive Ivor Lewis, uh, rather than a transhiatal. Uh, the reason we don't do minimally invasive transhiatal is the fact that we feel that, uh, and that's our only our own opinion, that we feel that the cervical incision, uh, cervical site uh, for the anastomosis has higher rates of uh, dysphagia, higher rates of recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, and uh, that with a circular stapled anastomosis, and a robotic approach in Ivor Lewis, you can get an anastomosis that's very close to cervical, uh, where a cervical anastomosis would be, meaning at the thoracic inlet. So unless a patient has an upper thoracic esophagus, esophageal cancer, 
uh, we usually perform in Ivor Lewis for all G junctions and mid thoracic esophageal tumors. For in the interest of time, uh, I will just skip here. Uh, we feel that uh, robotic surgery, we're, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, access to a robot. We feel that uh, there's some advantages uh, to a laparoscopic or thoracoscopic approach. Obviously, some of the disadvantages is the cost of the robot, the cost of the instruments, and also the lack of tactile feedback, a feeling in the hands like you would with thoracoscopy or thoracoscopy. But certainly, there's major advantages to robotic which may be touched on by other presenters. It's better dexterity. The instruments are wristed. The instruments are smaller. There's more precision because there's scaling of motion, meaning for every millimeter your hand moves on the joystick inside the patient, the instruments move less. So you can have more precision. There's of course the magnification of the 3D um, camera. And lastly, and I think that's the most important advantage to robotic surgery is the computer interface between the patient and the surgeon. And that computer interface and the software that will be coming out, because in my opinion, robotic surgery, it's still in its infancy, although the robot was first used in humans by Intuitive in 99, the FDA approval, we're still in the infancy. And I think that computer interface with the new software coming out is the future. We always start off with our own bronchoscopy, especially for mid esophageal tumors and uh, an endoscopy to be able to tell the extent of the tumor, but also to the extent of the Barrett's if there is Barrett's is if possible, we'd like to resect all Barrett's as well. I will skip all the, I will skip the, some of the, uh, the abdominal portion because Dr. Asti showed a very, very nice video and in the interest of time, I'll just uh, mention some additional rather than to repeat the videos and things. So for the abdominal portion, what we do is that we do uh, a pyloromyotomy. Uh, yes, some people uh, perform with uh, Botox. We do a pyloromyotomy. Robotically, we cocorize the duodenum. We place a feeding tube in all our patients. As was rightly mentioned, we avoid getting into the pleural cavity until the last minute. And we also, like Dr. Asti mentioned, we also place a drain. I use a 19 French Blake, which I actually place in the left pleural cavity through the abdomen. And the reason why I place in the left pleural cavity, it's to be able to drain any fluid uh, that may accumulate postoperatively. And we like to place it through the abdomen rather than between the left ribs, as uh, this is more comfortable for the patients. And we perform, we really skeletonize the descending thoracic aorta we get into the right and left pleural cavity, but the very last uh, step of this operation. And uh, this gives us the best circumferential margin. So as I said, I'll just mention, uh, I'll skip this. For the thoracic portion, uh, now that we have the XI robot, we finally are, or have access to the XI robot, we move the little bit of ports. So we place the patient in the lateral decubitus position and we just tilt the patient. We find it easier to just place like a regular thoracotomy position, lateral decubitus position, and then we just use the bed control to tilt them a little bit. So it's not really prone or semi-prone, it's just a mild tilt. Now what we do is that we place, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but we actually place a, the eight millimeter trocar, and that's about the ninth intercostal space posteriorly. And then now we place through this accessory port which other videos have shown, we actually place our camera through here. Then we place robotic arm number three through this incision, and it's an eight millimeter incision. And we place robotic arm number three, and we place uh, robotic arm number four in this incision, which is also at the fourth intercostal space, like my the previous presenters. At the time of the anastomosis, we place our EEA stapler through this accessory incision. We place a wound protector through here. That way we decrease the rate of wound infections as the conduit comes out and there's bacterial seeding in this area. We place an Alexis wound protector through this incision. Since we're placing the EEA here, at the time of the anastomosis, which is done at the bedside and not robotically, but rather using the robotic camera, 
we place our robotic camera or what is called port hopping or camera port hopping. We place our camera here for the anastomosis and we grab the anvil through this incision the fourth intercostal space. So at the time of the surgery, at the time of the anastomosis, the EEA stapler is here. The, the surgeon is at the bedside. The eight millimeter 30 degree thoracoscope for the camera is here. And the anvil grasper is in the fourth intercostal space here. I'm gonna just quickly through this, go through this video. If uh, we do not use CO2 throughout the whole case, we only insufflate CO2 for a pneumothorax initially in order to get better visualization of the surgical field. It, it pushes down the lung and we can see a little bit better, but seeing that we have our accessory port to place the EA and to exteriorize the specimen and the gastric conduit, we lose the CO2 at that point. So we only use CO2 initially. We divide the inferior pulmonary ligaments. We identify the inferior pulmonary vein. And seeing that the majority of our patients have G junction C word one or C word two tumors or very distal esophageal adenocarcinomas, we usually perform an Ivor Lewis esophagectomy with an anastomosis just underneath the azagous vein or just slightly above the azagous vein. So we denude the azagous vein. As you can see here, it's quite easy with the dexterous instruments from the robotic system. We use the vessel sealer for, uh, larger, in, for larger vessels coming off the aorta. We scoutinize the aorta as can be seen here. So this is the robotic vessel sealer. It's the equivalent of a ligature or the equivalent of a harmonic, but for the robot. We really scoutinize and we also identify the thoracic duct. We place two clips on the thoracic duct and we continue uh, scoutinizing all the way to the pericardium. We perform our lymphadenectomy of lymph node number eight, lymph node number nine, lymph node number seven on block with the tumor. Dr. Sun very, uh, elegantly demonstrated a recurrent laryngeal nerve lymphadenectomy on the right and the left. We only do this if we're dealing with tumors of the mid thoracic esophagus or uh, where we perform an anastomosis at the level of the thoracic inlet. So basically we do a, usually a standard lymphadenectomy for G junction tumors as that's the majority of our patients. We stop the level of our lymphadenectomy at the level where we're gonna create the anastomosis. So if I'm gonna create the anastomosis at the thoracic inlet, then I will do a paratracheal lymphadenectomy anterior and posterior to the trachea, also mentioned here as a recurrent laryngeal nerve lymphadenectomy. Seeing that we rarely go into the neck, we rarely perform ever a cervical or three field esophagic, uh, lymphadenectomy. In terms of the anastomosis, I will uh, fast forward for the sake of time. We divide the thoracic esophagus, as you can see here, right below the azagous vein. So I've mobilized the azagous vein, but I leave it intact. And the reason I leave it intact is that although sometimes we divide it and we create the anastomosis a centimeter or two below above it, here we can create the anastomosis right underneath it and it allows me to have the azagous vein fall down and protect the anastomosis if God forbid we get an anastomotic leak. We also use the orval anastomotic technique. The anesthesiologist brings it through the mouth. It's very important, in my opinion, to make it come out either exactly through the staple line or very close to the staple line. I think it is a mistake to bring out the, uh, anast uh, the orval on the side or underneath the esophagus as you will have two staple lines that are next to each other and create an ischemic area of the esophagus. So we bring out the orville as can be seen right through the uh, staple line. We then exteriorize our conduit as can be seen here. We please place the EEA stapler. Dr. Molina once did a presentation, very nicely done of the ICG dye that's given. And through Firefly, you can look at the uh, vascularization of your conduit and decide where to create the anastomosis. 
we usually just try to create the anastomosis as low as possible in the gastric conduit to have the best vascularization. We lift up the azagous vein as we create the synastomosis. So it's a circular, stapled, 25 millimeter anvil and uh, EEA anastomosis. We make sure the azagous vein is not in the anastomosis and that we don't get the trachea underneath either. So we make sure that the airway has been uh, spared. We then cut off the excess. We look at our donuts. You can see the staple line, we've overshown it. We place sutures here. The reason why we place these sutures is for two reasons. Number one is that this excess gastric conduit lies cephalad, so it does not create a diverticulum where food can uh, stay, decreases stasis in this area. Number two, it removes some of the tension on the anastomosis that can occur. Number three, it also allows us to exclude the anastomosis from the pleural cavity. So if a leak occurs, we have the anastomosis covered. We have it covered with the azagous vein. We have it covered by the gastric conduit. And most importantly, we harvest a large piece of omentum to perform an omentoplasty. You can see here this omentum that I bring around in a 360 degree fashion around the gastric conduit. So I secure both sides of the omentum and wrap the conduit in a 360 degree fashion. So if there's a leak, usually that leak will happen in the subcranial space. So the omentum completely fills up the subcranial space. We also place uh, a stitch at the level of the hiatus to decrease the risk of herniation. We always divide the right cruise. We do not divide the left cruise. If we have a transverse colon that's very redundant at the time of the abdominal portion of the procedure, we usually do a colopexy or we place a few stitches between the transverse colon and the diaphragm to decrease the risk of having colon, um, colon herniation into the left chest because that's the most common thing that we found in terms of herniation has been a redundant transverse colon. Here we see ICG dye being given and the firefly voo. And you can see, unfortunately, this is the SI. It's not as good, but you can see good vascularization of our gastric conduit. And you can see the omentum that's being wrapped in a 360 degree fashion, therefore excluding the anastomosis from the pleural cavity. This is a video that shows how the, this is the subcranial space, the back of the trachea, our lymphadenectomy underneath on this area. And you can see here that the anastomosis is almost at the thoracic inlet. And in fact, we can create an anastomosis all the way to the thoracic inlet, which is almost where a cervical anastomosis would be. If you perform a cervical anastomosis, by the time you put it back down, it usually lies at the, at the thoracic inlet. And robotically with an EA stapler, you can make this anastomosis all the way to the thoracic inlet if need be. We do not perform an EGD routinely, but this is an image I have of an anastomosis on day eight. This is a barium swallow that shows that there was no anastomotic leak. And this is how it looks like. We try to avoid doing a J pouch if possible. We try to make a four centimeter conduit as was mentioned. And this is what the anastomosis looks like on day eight. If one performs an endoscopy early on, the anastomosis and the gastric conduit always looks worse than one would anticipate, but they usually heal very well. So do not panic 
if for whatever reason the patient had an endoscopy. We do not recommend routine endoscopy, but if an endoscopy is done, do not pan if it, if it does not look perfect. This is anastomosis that healed with no leak. This is a CT scan that illustrates how the omentum is used. We wrap in a 300 degree, 360 degree fashion around. And then you can see here with my cursor how the omentum is all around the gastric conduit and more importantly, in the subcrinal space. Anastomotic leaks can occur as you can see here in this barium swallow. Most of our anastomotic leaks occur in this area in the subcrinal space. Having omentum here makes it that this leak is contained and this leak is treated non-operatively. We rarely ever use stents to treat our leaks. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Fontaine. It was very nice. And also the video was extremely fantastic. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, so the next lecture is minimally invasive uh, surgery uh, for esophageal cancer with the technique of Ivor Lewis uh, by Professor Patin, uh, the professor of uh, Ghent University Hospital. I'm, I wish I pronounced it correctly from the Belgium. Thank you very much for your introduction and the opportunity to speak. Um, I saw a lot of nice videos. I saw already that a lot of colleagues were in Iran. I've not got the opportunity to be there, but on the other hand, I have saw some Iran in my department. Next to me is Dr. Niki Rashidian, who's uh, joined me for uh, esophageal surgery and her doctorate. So I want to present, first of all, my um, team. Um, you see that there are a lot of surgeons, scrap nurses, coordinators, oncologists, researchers, dietitians, pathologists. If you want to do this kind of program, you need a lot of people and you, have, you need to have a good cooperation between these people. The second thing is that in Belgium, the situation is that we have only 10 referral hospitals having the permittance to do this kind of surgery. It was a kind of competition, a zero point uh, measurement of complications and volume and quality. And these centers were selected. And uh, one of the centers, the lowest one, is our center, University Hospital of Ghent in, in uh, Belgium. So these are the people who, who are working, referring our, to our center patients. You see a lot of uh, hospitals are referring. Also some uh, hospitals from the Netherlands because Netherlands is very nearby. So we are a kind of coordinator of the orchestra. And in this way, we try to do the best for the patients. If you have been elected by the government, you have from time to time audits about what you're doing. So publications are very nice to, to describe your results, but uh, benchmarking, it's uh, worthwhile to see what is your position in the country. So we have uh, an idea about the proportion of postoperative mortality, 30 days, 90 days. There are zero resection, the observed survival, percentage of complications, and also the time interval from diagnosis to start of treatment. So recently we had some results of this benchmarking. And if you are um, adapted to see this kind of funnel plots, then you see that there are three major centers in Belgium and a lot of minor of the 10 referral centers. The one in red is uh, our group. And you see that we are at a level of proportion of uh, patients um, uh, diagnosed and operated in time. But if you see that the quality um, examination was 90% in one month, uh, nearly no center was able to do this. So this is already one point we have to make um, uh, better performances in future. 
And so you can go for every time the medium length of time. We have 10 days. Um, it's too much in the ERAS protocol. And um, patients normally, they come the day before. Now we have a system, they come at the day of surgery and we will gain one day. Uh, concerning the um, uh, postoperative complications, you have here fellow plots and our center is nicely at the same level of the, the other high volume centers. So this is just an example that you can evaluate every center. And you see also that uh, the lower the volume, the more scattered are the results of uh, the, uh, the centers. Uh, we have also quality indicators. For instance, if you have enough lymph nodes resected, but also about non-operative uh, procedures. For instance, if you have a too high amount of T1A lesions, shows that your endoscopic removal is not at the level as should be expected. So coming now to um, the operation techniques, uh, as mentioned before in a very nice way, you have different techniques. And also we are looking for the Ivor Lewis one uh, before open and now the golden standard is the minimal invasive one. So the first part is the laparoscopic where we uh, use the bench the beach uh, chair position, it's very easy. And then we go for uh, video. The video is um, twice uh, the speed, so to be honest. And you have a, a, a view outside in the operation room and you have a view inside um, the human body. The patient is um, T2. Um, lower esophagus um, um, tumor. And uh, he's also um, a seaward tube. So we start from this position because we are uh, doing the anastomosis in the thorax. It's the laparoscopy is the first part. With the normal way of working, the placing of the different trocars. And we use uh, this kind of retractor, what we call the Nathanson retractor. We um, are very fond of it because it doesn't move, it's steady and makes a nice view on uh, the hiatus. And the first step of the dissection is the, um, uh, looking for the bursa mentalis and going up and dividing by the harmonic at the safe level and going in this way to the left gastroepiploic artery. You see also the stomach tube, the left uh, gastroepiploic, and we use normally here the harmonic to do this. And then we continue the dissection until we see the left pillar. And having seen the left pillar, we continue a little bit into the mediastinum, not to, for, uh, to speed up, but uh, not to go into the left pleura because then the anesthetist can have some problems we will end up the laparoscopic uh, um, stage with a uh, dissection into the mediastinum. Some connections with the pancreas. And then opening the omentum minus. And then we have a kind of fiend we see in front of the um, Gastric artery, we call it the sentinel vein. It shows us the way. We don't look now for the for the lymph nodes of the hepatic lymph nodes. We do it later on, because we have the impression if we give it in block, the the section of the lymph node is not so carefully done by the pathologist, and we give them separately to 
um, in order to the region. The section is going on to the pillars, going up the right one, the left one. And then we continue with the front side to the pillars. As I mentioned, we don't go into the mediastinum itself for this moment. We will do it later on. And then some cochon maneuver is done, releasing the attachments to the gallbladder and the colon to have a, a nice pull up of uh, the gastric tube. The end point of having this dissection is in is uh, seeing the vena cava from the duodenum site, and then we stop the dissection. After having done this, the gastric tube will be performed. And we are looking for two centimeters distance from the pylorus to start with the first stapler. As you see, we uh, are uh, staying to the right side of the patient for the application of the first one. And we have a tube with the diameter of four staples next to each other. Then we go up, stretching nicely from the right side. And then we will change between the legs of the patient again, as you see in the video at the left side. And making a gastric tube. Then in this video, you will see that we will do an ICG, but normally we only do one ICG and we do it at the moment of the esophagus um, at the thoracic part. So here you see the cleaning up and the lymphadenectomy of the hepatic artery region with also dissecting the lymph nodes in front of the cava and next to the porta. Uh, we use for this reason the harmonic because we know that there are some, um, this is the end result where you have uh, all the lymph nodes resected. Uh, then some discussion, uh, the preceding author was talking about the pilloroplasty. We did it. Now we don't do it anymore. We did the series with and out and there's no difference in outcome. So uh, this is, um, yeah, it can be done, but in fact, um, we don't do it routinely anymore. But it's the, the moment that we switch from a surgeon and that the uh, attending surgeon or a helping surgeon can do also something. It makes a little bit like the flight that the pilot and co-pilot are changing of place. So after this, we will place the gastric tube in a bag. And why doing this? Because uh, if you pull up the stomach, as one of the other said, uh, it's harmful to do the pull up on the stomach itself. Uh, we are a little bit afraid to pull on the omentum. So for that reason, we uh, will pull, um, place it into a bag. But before, as mentioned, the ICG. So if we are not so happy with the ICG, we already place a clip where, for instance, it's not as it should be. And maybe we do the resection afterwards in the thoracic part. So here we place the clip and below it was very nicely um, on the fluoroscopy. So here is the back. The stomach and the omentum are inside. And then the back is reconnected to the already bluish stomach. And so we can pull on the, on the back and we don't harm in that way the omentum or the stomach. So this is uh, the, the laparoscopic part. It will be drained. And we also do a gestionostomy in every patient. 
So concerning the thoracic part is that we are looking for um, the position. You have two big universities in, in Belgium. Leuven is performing the prone position. We're doing the semi-prone and we call it the sleeping beauty position. So in, in practice, this is a situation where the patient is a semi-prone, well fixed, yet you can rotate anyhow in all positions. So we go for um, a video with the thoracoscopy in the sleeping beauty position. We have the marker points for um, the um, trocars. Again, it's in the two times the speed. The scrub nurses are very fast, but not so fast. We introduce uh, the different trocars. We use the double lumen uh, tube with an intrathoracic pressure of eight. And normally uh, the lung is um, retracted by itself by this way. And then we can do it by simple coagulation or you can do it by the harmonic one. And I prefer now the, the little harmonic one, but it's in this movie still cautery will be used. As we saw very nicely in the preceding video, we open the uh, um, uh, the pleura. And in our center, we only resect the thoracic duct when there is a suspicion of invasion. Uh, in the other uh, situations, we just let it in place. So the section is started from the azygos. If this is an, a low lesion, as in the preceding video, we will do the anastomosis below the azygos. And higher up, we go above the azygos by transecting it also. And here you see that we did already a nice dissection into the um, uh, thorax by abdominal part, and we reconnect both incision sites. The ligamentum to the lung is cut it. And then we go to the pericardium and take all uh, lesions and lymph nodes. So this is a, a little bit the transaction site uh, and we will uh, introduce the stapler. We always do a purse string to introduce it. We have time because now the section site above and down will be examined during the operation and it takes time. So we want to avoid that there's still, for instance, Barrett or some tumor. And uh, it takes about uh, 45 minutes. And in meantime, we will resect the lymph nodes. We will do the pull up of the stomach and we will do the pursing with normally the 28 uh, Covidian stapler. So you see here that the sac will come and you can manipulate it and you can bring in our sometimes fatty patients because they are not like the spinal patients, the adenocarcinoma patients. You can bring up the stomach in a safe way. So for this, we have a, a, a small incision with the Alexis that we can bring out the stomach. Here is a sac also brought out and then the purse string will be done manually. Uh, we saw that there are some instruments that you can do it in um, a mechanical way, but it's the usual way of working we do with the purse string, um, with afterwards one added purse string to be sure. And in most cases, we can uh, place a, 20, a 28 staple. So everything is done by the same trucars. If for instance, we have to do a dissection of the lymph nodes above, we add one trocar above the scapula to do the dissection introduction of the, the anvil. And then first ring, with the nut pusher 
and one added uh, per string to be sure if necessary. But here you see that it's better to do it to have a nice donut afterwards. So then we will do uh, the, the dissection of the lymph nodes. This is done by Cotri because we are a little bit afraid that um, sometimes with the uh, harmonic that the bronchus is a little bit too close and we feel unsafe. So then waiting for the frozen section, the announcement was good and then the connection. Um, we are doing this in this way, checking first with ECG again, if everything is okay. And afterwards, we will make a little incision again on the staple line down to make the anastomosis. So we open again a little bit the staple line and then by the utility port, one of the surgeons move to the other side of the patient and will introduce then, as you see in the left movie, the 28. The anastomosis here is done double stapling, but now we do it as uh, the preceding author does with an end to side. This is still one true staple line itself. Looking for the rotation and then the connection. We seal a little bit the anastomosis with this seal. Uh, a lot of companies start now by showing this. We do this already more than 25 years with this kind of device. If it works, I don't know. It's a kind of habit in our department. So at the end, you can close the, the staple line. You open for the introduction of the uh, EEA with some sutures, or you can simple staple it. Nowadays, we try to save one stapler by just doing it manually and we close it. Here, it's still performed with a staple, and normally you, you even need two staples. And then afterwards, we will do the same thing as the preceding author. We will wrap a little bit the anastomosis with the omentum, and we will fixate the stomach to the azygous fin to avoid that there is too much traction on the anastomosis. So the rest of the glue, the wrapping of the fat between the anastomosis and the bronchus and some connection between pleura or azygos with the stomach. And then we drain and then we go for um, the, the scheme we have of the strategy for the ERAS protocol, where everything is well marked for the patient and for the nurses. But most important is the mobilization of our patient having a good result. And the last one is we do um, an X-ray and we do the X-ray on, um, day five, and this gives us an idea, not only for the anastomosis, but also what is the positioning, if there's a kinking, if there's a nice outflow of um, the anastomosis, it's important. So this is the way we are working in Ghent, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. It was very nice. Thank you. Uh, so because of the time, we had to go fast and 
The next lecture is about minimally, uh, sorry, is uh, management of the complication following uh, esophagectomy. This is a very hard topic and very important, uh, run by Professor Herbala from Brazil, Federal University of Sao Paulo. Thank, thank you very much for, for this invitation. I'm very honored. Let me share my screen. Okay, I guess you are seeing me now. So again, I'm very honored by this invitation. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot be in person to meet these beautiful mountains there in Tehran, but we hope next time we, we can be there. Uh, well, I need to talk today about the management of complications following esophagectomy. Uh, as you said, this is a very hard topic. We, we could organize a whole meeting on this. So I'll be very brief on, the, on the, uh, each of these topics. Since we've, we have a very international panel of experts here, we can discuss together some of these complications. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. So in the next minutes, I will try to speak about three topics. First of all, uh, what are the complications that may follow in esophagectomy? Second, we need to speak if the, these complications are different for minimally invasive operations. Do they create a higher number of complications or a different set of complications since this is a minimally invasive meeting? And uh, finally, how to manage these, these complications? Well, uh, Dr. Bonavina said that today esophagectomy is a very safe procedure. I absolutely disagree with him. This is a very morbid procedure. Dr. Molena and, and Dr. Demister was discussing how to avoid an esophagectomy in the first discussion. How can you spare some patients of undergoing an esophagectomy have probably a, an endoscopic treatment? I used to say that when I leave the operating room after uh, I've done an esophagectomy, my thought is I, I should not be doing this. Probably science is needed to develop some alternative to this. I'm not doing good to the patient. Totally different when I do a anti-reflux operation that I leave the operating room very happy that I did something that probably is the best. So uh, these are some data from Dr. Molina that presented us uh, early in this day. And we can see, uh, as I said, esophagectomy is a very morbid, complica uh, very, very morbid uh, procedure. So what are the complications that may follow this pr procedure? Probably the majority of complications, as we saw in the previous slides, they are clinical complications. And surgeons, they do not act on the treatment of these complications in most cases. They may act on the prevention. And how do we prevent these clinical complications from happening? We need to do a very careful patient selection and follow some clinical pathways and protocols that have been shown to decrease this number of clinical complications. There are some uh, surgical complications that are unrelated to this specific procedure. They can happen in any other procedure like uh, abdominal thoracic wall procedure, uh, complications, trocar accidents, crashing of the robot system, small ball obstruction. I will not go through this because this is very general and we don't have time for that. So I will follow this standardization uh, that was headed by Dr. Lowe and this group. And they quote that specific surgical complications for esophagectomy are mainly the anastomotic leak, the conduit necrosis, the conduit failure, leak in the vocal cord palsy. And again, I'm more than happy to discuss and take questions during my presentation and the, all the other experts, if they want to interrupt me, please. Uh, if we do this in a way of discussion, this will be much more uh, useful to everybody. So uh, let's answer the first question. Are the, are the complications different for minimally invasive? I have several meta-analyses to help me answer this, uh, this question. And if you look at this large meta-analysis with 63 studies, there are no difference for an astomotic leak in vocal cord palsy if we look at open versus minimally invasive surgery. If we take a look at the conduit failure and conduit necrosis, the same thing, 
a smaller meta-analysis not all studies mentioned these two types of complications. We didn't find no differences between open and minimally invasive uh, operations. How about for Kyle Wick? Again, not too many studies uh, mentioned this, but even though we have almost 100 of them, and Kyle Lick also was not different when we, when we compared uh, minimally invasive and open surgery. So uh, in general terms, we can say that minimally invasive surgery is not associated to an increased number of complications, nor to specific complications related specifically to the esophagectomy. Again, I'm not considering trocar problems or robot crashing or things like this. So how do we manage all these main complications? Uh, this is standardization. Again, they created classifications. And these classifications, they were very useful because they are based on the treatment that we can apply to this very type of, of problems. So they made my life very easy. So if we look at the anastomotic leak, this is probably the most common complication, surgical complication that may occur after uh, an esophagectomy. Uh, outcomes are much better with the use of staplers uh, as compared to Hensu anastomosis. Uh, some say that lateral lateral anastomosis uh, also brings a, a lower uh, rate of anastomotic leak. I was very surprised that uh, all the previous presenters that uh, did an intrathoracic anastomosis just uh, used a circular stapler, and no one of them had a, a linear stapler doing a lateral lateral anastomosis. And if they could comment on that, I would be very happy. So this classification classification says that type one is just a local defect that requires no additional therapy uh, apart from dietary modification. Uh, this is very simple. Everybody had a, a fistula leak like that. Uh, in one or two or three days, it, it's just uh, healed. Type 2 is the one that needs uh, some kind of intervention. From radiology to opening of the incision, which we do in uh, all of the cases, if the, the leak stands for more than one or two days, and packing of this incision. And finally, type three is much more complicated and requires a surgical therapy. So what we do for type one? Type one, usually uh, there's no uh, intervention more radical that we need to do. We leave all, all, all of our patients with a nasoenteric tube. We don't like to do uh, a jejunostomy to feed these guys. We had a lot of complications with it. We are more than happy to use only a nasoenteric tube. So that doesn't need to be interrupted. Uh, we used the past some drugs to decrease saliva production, asked the patients to spit his saliva, manual compression of the fistula. Uh, although these uh, still are mentioned in some uh, modern series, it's practically more than historical. Uh, if we go to type two, uh, we need to do uh, some intervention on that because uh, the depth is too much, or because it's created some problems to the patient or uh, the time to heal is too long. So uh, what the literature brings more uh, now is the endoscopic treatment. So if we talk about stenting of this uh, leak by endoscopy, it has 70% of success, but it has 30% of complications, mainly migration due to the diameter of the conduit that's much larger than the, the natural esophagus, and some cases of uh, perforation. Unfortunately, there is not in the literature uh, clear predictors for success for order to us to uh, select which patients would benefit better from stenting. And I say uh, benefit better from stenting because other very good alternative is vacuum therapy. Uh, also done by endoscopy, a uh, sponge is placed around the fistula and this is connected to uh, a vacuum. Uh, some studies, they show better outcomes than stents for uh, an astomotic leak after an esophagectomy, but it requires multiple changes, multiple procedures. So it's something that must be uh, weighted in countries that doesn't have this resource, resource or doesn't have much money to do that. 
And again, there are no clear predictors for success in order for us to uh, choose between vacuum therapy or uh, stenting. There are other endoscopic therapies, but the, the experience is very limited, like, like clips, suture, glue. Uh, most of them, they come the experience from bariatric surgery uh, and the endoscopy is I applying these to anastomotic leaks. But again, uh, there are only case reports and very few experience with this. Uh, type three is some severe cases that we need to act as surgeons and do something. Usually this happens for uncontained leak uh, associated to sepsis and necrosis of the conduit. Uh, usually this is managed by the conduit resection uh, with an esophagostomy or immediate reconstruction depending on, on how sick the patient is. But again, this is very rare. I came with that like two, two times during my experience. If we follow to the second uh, complication that may occur after an esophagectomy, let's talk a, bit, a little bit about conduit necrosis. And again, I'm very aided by this standardization of this group, uh, which classified the conduit necrosis in three types. Tri type one uh, is just a, a focal uh, necrosis, and treatment is again, not interventional. Type two, uh, it's associated with, with a leak and a surgical therapy is necessary, but not involved in esophageal diversion. And finally, the type more severe is type three with extensive conduit necrosis and the treatment is resection of the conduit. This may occur from 10 to 20%, uh, sorry, we pass now to the conduit failure. And conduit failure may occur from 10 to 20% of the cases. Uh, for type 1, uh, the only treatment is enteric dietary modifications. For type 2, uh, total parenteral nutrition is necessary inside for type 3, and we need some interventional or surgical therapy. Most of the speakers, again, uh, mentioned about doing a pyloroplasty or a pyloromyotomy during the esophagectomy. I do not do it anymore following Dr. Patin uh, example. I used to do in the past, I'm not doing it anymore. So what we do for type one, uh, there are a few studies on what to do on these not severe cases. Uh, usually they are self-limited. You do not, do, not to do, do not need to do uh, much things. Just wait a little bit, just a nasogastric decompression for a couple of days it's all that's needed. Some studies, they say about pharmacological treatment with prokinetic drugs, but this is very controversial and I don't have much experience on that. Uh, if we pass to type number three, in which we need to do something, we need to be more interventional, this can be done by endoscopy or by operation. So for endoscopy, the alternatives we have is a dilatation, and I'm not mentioning this during the operation. I'm saying this in these cases that no treatment for the palaros were, were doing during the initial esophagectomy, and the patients evoluted with a conduit failure. So even though we can do an endoscopic dilatation, an endoscopy is safe after the, the uh, after an esophagectomy, this was mentioned here before, and there are very good results even if a previous myotomy was performed and was not uh, successful. You can do uh, a peroral myotomy, uh, very similar to a POEM, but there are a few cases in the literature. Probably it's a more demanding uh, procedure. I don't think it's necessary uh, more than endoscopic dilatation. Some other studies show that a simple Botox injection is more than enough. As I mentioned, some cases are self-limited. It's just for a couple of days and you can uh, reestablish the, uh, the progress of food through this conduct. There are the other uh, less studied types of management for this, like electrostimulation, but uh, the number of patients is very uh, small for us to, to draw any conclusions. Uh, if we need to be uh, more radical and we need to operate on this and replace this conduit because it's not working even with uh, endoscopic treatment, 
uh, there are some things that can be done. This is a very interesting, uh, interesting uh, study in the literature. It encompasses only seven patients, but all these seven patients, they had a pyloroplasty and there was not resolution of this uh, conduit failure. So what the authors did is they tried to fix any mechanical problem that would be preventing this conduit to empty. So they try to strengthen the conduit by dissecting it and reapplying some stitches to make it straight, uh, some plication to reduce the diameter of the conduit, uh, uh, paraesophageal hernia correction if there was one present. In all cases, they redid the pyloroplasty. They had very good results. So these are simple operations, not radical as replacing the, the conduit, but again, there are only seven patients. Uh, other complication that may occur is chyo leak. This uh, is very prone to happen because of extensive lymphadenectomy, because of uh, the normal uh, types of variations, anatomic variations that may occur uh, of the thoracic duct. So uh, you can manage initially by conservative treatment. Drainage is more than, than enough. Some cases you can do a pleurodesis just to obliterate that space and prevent more leak. Uh, it's very important to keep a nutritional support uh, with close attendance to this because there's a lot of uh, nutrients that are lost by, by this drainage. Uh, you can also use uh, parenteral nutrition with uh, high protein and low fat diets. And it's kind of controversial if octreotide will decrease the output of this fistula or not. Uh, if you need to be more interventional and more radical, you can perform a ductal ligation. You need to reoperate the patient and unblock, uh, ligate all the tissue around the aorta to uh, prevent this leak. And some authors, they mentioned that the sooner you do this, the better the outcomes. The less you depopulate the nutrition of the patient. So these are some uh, parameters that some authors use in order to indicate a more radical intervention for leak. Some say that if you have an output higher than two liters after two days, it's time to do something radical. Or if you have over one liter in 24 hours, irrespective of the day, you also should to intervene on this patient. Well, finally, uh, how to manage the vocal cord palsy. This happens uh, due to lesion of the laryngeal nerve. It can occur at the neck or it, it can occur at the, at the chest. Usually when it occurs at the neck, it's transient. It, there's nothing you need to do. When it occurs at the chest, the uh, problem is more uh, permanent. So there's again a classification for that based on the same standardization in which type one, it's only a transient injury. Uh, there's no necessary therapy. It's just a palsy, not a, a paralysis. And you can use uh, some uh, dietary modification just to ease the swallow. Number two, uh, you need to do something. You need to, uh, for instance, medialize uh, the cartilages in order to uh, prevent aspiration. And number three is much more uh, severe. So uh, during the uh, acute phase, what you need to do is to prevent aspiration. And who can help you the most is a speech and language pathologist at this time. Uh, if this persists for longer in the chronic phase, you probably need to call uh, your ENT colleague in order to do some procedure on the larynx to prevent this from happening. So my conclusion is uh, complications are not more common or different if you are employing a minimally invasive surgery as compared to open surgery. These complications, they may vary in severity from complications that there's nothing you need to do from complications that need to take the patient again to the OR and resect the conduit. Surgeons today, they may act more on prevention than on treatment of most complications. So we need to be aware and try to institute most of these pathways as we can. 
Uh, and I show that a multidisciplinary team is very, very necessary. Dr. Petting showed his team, and that's that's very uh, great to know that there is this. Uh, and but most most places this is not always available. So if we go through uh, each of these complications, some take home lessons that we can uh, leave from this talk is that for an astomotic leak, most cases are not severe, especially if they are on the neck, there's nothing you need to do. And if you need to be more radical, probably the endoscopist is the one you should to call because the endosco endoscopic techniques are the ones with better results. If you face a conduit necrosis, some mild cases, they are just treated as an esophageal perforation, but severe cases, they occur in very sick patients. Probably you need to take this patient to the OR and they will have a very high morbidity and mortality. If you have a conduit failure, it's not emptying well. Endoscopy may help in most cases, but remember, uh, in the acute phase, there must be a uh, spontaneous resolution, so don't be radical uh, very soon. If you face a chyolic, uh, intervention should be done very quick if this patient is not doing well. And finally, for vocal cord palsy, we need to call our colleagues a speech language pathologist at the beginning for the acute phase. If this is going for the chronic phase, an ENT surgeon can help us with the larynx. So this is what I could do for 15 minutes. And again, I'm very thankful for this invitation and I'm ready for questions. And thank you, Professor uh, Herbert. I have one question. If sure. you want to intervene with a chyle uh, leakage as a, as a procedure, which procedure do you prefer by minimal invasive or open surgery in order to ligate the chyle tract? Uh, you, you mean for chyolic? Yeah, of course. I, I think minimal invasive is, is much easier to do. If you, you can do this by thoracoscopy or you can do this by laparoscopy. Either way, I think it's very easy because most times you don't need to identify the, the duct that's leaking. Uh, you can do that. You can offer some high fat meal during the operation to see if you can uh, notice the leak. But most times we just do uh, uh, en masse uh, ligation of the tissue to the right of the aorta. That's all that's necessary in most cases. Uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation. My pleasure. Uh, uh, so we go for the last lecture uh, by Professor Babake Durinayer. Um, uh, he's a very nice friend of me. And uh, the lecture is about EMR and EST of esophageal cancer technique. Thank you. Professor Nuri Nayer, you are at your service. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, do you have my presentation? I want to know if you can see my presentation. Please share it screen. Can you see it? No. Okay. Can you see the presentation now? Uh, no. Please uh, click on share a screen once oh. again. Yeah. Hello, Professor Nuri Nayer. Hello. Do you see the share screen option in the bottom? Yes, I, I have done it and um, okay. I think I could manage to do it. Oh, yeah. You see it now? Yeah, okay. okay. Right now it's okay. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. okay. Hello and thank you for the invitation. And um, my task today is to give you an overview of the um, endoscopic techniques which can help us to manage early esophageal carcinomas. And um, I have nothing um, to declare uh, to this topic. 
So uh, the reason that uh, this topic is important is that uh, with minimal invasive surgeries, uh, including the endoscopic techniques, we have less post-operative pain, less complications, maybe uh, at least in short term or maybe in the long term, less wound infections, less hernia formation, improved cosmesis, lower short-term cost. And also we hope that by these techniques, we may have optimal mid and long-term surgical and oncological outcomes. And uh, in the field of endoscopy, uh, technological improvements uh, have begun from the 19s and uh, with the advent of uh, flexible endoscopies in the 1950s and later on uh, the improvements of the techniques and innovations like notes, we are now uh, possible to give our, our patients opportunity to have their cancers managed uh, in a less um, invasive way. The techniques that I'm going to cover today is the EMR, ESD, the tunneling techniques. I will not go through the notes. And uh, the EMR, as you all know, is, stands for endoscopic mucosal resection. It can be done in different techniques in different parts of the gastrointestinal tract. And uh, Dr. Demister and Dr. Molina previously have shown that uh, they, how they do it in their practice. In my practice, I usually don't use cap and I usually don't use the ligation. Uh, I think that if you have a very good um, high resolution endoscope and pay attention to the IPCL pattern, uh, you can do it uh, with inject and cut technique. Uh, I use CAP just to give me some uh, space just uh, to pass my instruments, but I usually don't use the C or ligation assisted one. And this is the overview of the EMR. As you see, it all is about making a space in the submucosal space. And this gives us uh, not, not only an opportunity to remove the lesion, but also gives us some information about the TS stage. Because if you can't leave, uh, lift the lesion completely after injection into the submucosa and you have um, dimples, then it shows that uh, at least in that part, the lesion has already invaded into the muscularis proprio. So uh, this is an example of the CEMR when you use a cap and uh, many uh, colleagues are actually interested to do it in the esophagus. I don't do it myself. This is the ligation one that Dr. Demister previously showed and uh, you use a band and then you cut below, below the uh, band. You can use it in different parts of the lesion. And uh, I, I prefer the piecemeal EMR, the inject, lift, cut, and then if the lesion is more than 20 millimeters, I, I usually use the piecemeal EMR. The complications of EMR, if, uh, if you have done uh, enough, is very low, especially with the new uh, instruments that can, we can use to control the hemorrhage. Uh, overall, the hemorrhage rate is one to 11 percent, and the most of the cases can be uh, controlled endoscopically. The perforation is 5 percent, but I think that in my practice, I have never had any perforation. If you will have a good uh, submucosal injection, uh, it's very rare to have this kind of um, uh, adverse event. Uh, if your lesion is um, larger than two uh, centimeter, then it's better to use the endoscopic submucosal dissection. And this is an overview which begins with staining, marking around the lesion, injecting on the marks and incise uh, around the lesion, then, then you can dissect, uh, 
collect and do hemostasis. Different um, knives and different instruments are now available to do ESD in the esophagus. And this is an example of how it is done, but previously the other colleagues also showed interesting and beautiful pictures in their own practice. The ESD complications is also comparable uh, to EMR. Bleeding is not too much, zero to two percent. Perforation is between five to 10 percent. Uh, subclinical novomediastinum has been reported in 50%, at least in Japanese series, but it's not a major complication, doesn't need any uh, medical uh, intervention. Delayed perforation is very rare, post-procedural pain is not too much, and post-operative stricture in EST uh, is a concern that we will deal with it in, a, in the next few slides. The stricture usually depends on the circumference of the esophagus involved. So if, less, if your lesion is less than half the circumference of the esophagus, it's very rare to have post ESD stricture, around 2%. If uh, it is less than 3 fourths of the circumference, it is around 20%. And then if you have a total circumferential involvement or more than three fourth, uh, it will be around 90%. Uh, there are some measures that we can use to prevent this complication. Uh, if you use local steroid injection just after the EST, it may help. Uh, triamcinolone acetonide has been used in the literature and uh, just uh, make sure that if you are going to inject it, you need to inject it uh, not in a vertical uh, angle, but in a tandem angle, just into the remained submucosal tissue. If you inject it directly into the muscularis propria, it may lead to uh, necrosis. Uh, there are some uh, other measures like uh, using fully covered retrievable stents, which have been uh, reported from China and others, and it is also a viable option. And uh, there are other uh, measures that are under investigation, and I have just mentioned them here, just to know that what's uh, going on in this field in the future. Uh, the Results for ES, um, sorry, I think that uh, they were, yes. The results for ESD uh, are good. 98% in block resection, R0 resection in 86%, local recurrence only in 3%. Um, in the, uh, uh, if, um, if we go through the uh, long-term outcomes of the ESD, the five-year survival, disease-free survival is complete. Endoscopic surveillance is requ required for metachronous cancer. And we usually, uh, you, we need, you need to do it every six to one year, six months to one year. Uh, for the absolute indications of ESD that I will uh, explain it in the next few slides. And if you have relative indications, then you need to do it more frequently. Um, one, another technique that which, uh, which has been um, described recently is the tunneling techniques, uh, which includes the endoscopic submucosal tunnel dissection and uh, the submucosal tunnel endoscopic resection, which uh, is uh, for submucosal lesions in the esophagus. And this is the overall overview of the ESTD. It begins uh, with uh, uh, marking of the proximal and uh, distal parts of the lesion. Afterwards, uh, we usually use a knife 
just uh, to cut through these areas and then we mark the lateral size of the lesion. A tunnel is being performed uh, and made by the endoscope. And then uh, the lateral parts of the lesion is being cut. And uh, this is an example of an ESTD. And uh, it's a very useful technique when you have a very large lesion. Uh, we need to, uh, as Dr. Demister and Dr. Molina previously mentioned, uh, this patient selection in the, uh, for using these techniques is very important because in the case of uh, esophageal squamous cell carcinoma, usually uh, the best lesion and the absolute indications to remove is when the lesion is limited to the epithelium or, or have not yet involved the muscular propria because uh, muscular mucosa because uh, after the, the tumor cells reach to the submucosa, the chances for lymph node, uh, local lymph node involvement um, increases. So the chances for a curative resection by endoscopic method uh, will decrease as the depth of the uh, involvement increases. In endoscopy, we usually use a uh, morphological classification. When we use the type zero, it means that the endoscopist feels that the lesion is limited to the epithelium. And uh, then if it is protruding type, it is zero one, which may be pedunculated or sessile. Uh, if slightly elevated, it is uh, 0 to A. If it is quite flat, it is 0 to B. And if it is a little depressed, it is 0 to C. The 0, 3 type is excavated type. This is an example of 0, 1, P, which stands for pedunculated. Sometimes we have a a mixture of the morphology, like this region, which is which is zero one S cisal and zero two uh, C because it is a little depressed. Uh, for the endoscopic diagnosis of early esophageal cancer, it is uh, important that, that the recent developments in our endoscopy especially the equipment-based image-enhanced endoscopes uh, can show us uh, the, the early, um, early changes in the mucosa of the, of the esophagus that can lead us to the diagnosis of early cancers. NBI, BLI, eye scans, and together with magnified endoscopy, which shows us the microsurface and the microvascular pattern of the esophageal mucosa, help us to diagnose uh, esophageal cancers in early states. The Japanese also has a morphological uh, uh, classification for the advanced types of cancer, like type one, two, three, and four. But uh, I, I don't think that this has any clear relationship to the uh, to the uh, this, this, our decision toward uh, how to manage the patient or to predict the future of the patient. These are examples of early lesions of the esophagus on white lamp imaging and early 0 to A. To type 2 and type 3 cancers. The type 2 and 3 cancers are uh, locally advanced tumors. And um, with white lamp imaging, maybe it is a little bit difficult to diagnose the early esophageal cancers. Any change in the vasculature or in the pattern of the IPCLs should be noted. Uh, local staining uh, may help, but as Dr. Demister uh, described, it is cumbersome. Uh, local usually stains normal esophageal mucosa as dark brown, and the early cancers usually do not stain. But it may uh, make the subsequent endoscopy a little bit difficult. Uh, 
Sometimes we have multiple legal void lesions, which is being described with the field carcinogenesis theory. And in these cases, uh, there is also a higher risk for early cancer in the upper uh, di digestive tract like stomach. On MBI view, the, the areas of cancer are usually shown as brown areas, but not all brown areas on MBI view are usually cancerous lesions. So uh, together with the change in the color, abnormal microvascular pattern, abnormal microsurface pattern, especially the change in IPCLs are important to diagnose through early cancer lesions. This is an example of a brown area on MBI. And um, the Japanese also uh, described the, uh, the, the tatami no mi sign uh, this is uh, the, the sign that if you see it on the early lesions, the chance is that the lesion is early and has not yet invaded deep into the sudden mucosa. But uh, the, based on the morphology uh, itself, it is very difficult to estimate the depth of invasion. Uh, endoscopic ultrasound, uh, if if it is going to be helpful, it should be done with uh, mini probes at 20 to 30 milli megahertz. And it, it will give you a nine layered uh, echo pattern, but uh, it, I, I think that it has a very um, limited role in our decision about the depth of, inf of, of invasion. Uh, I think that doing an EMR and EST together with collaboration with an interested pathologist uh, will give us much better information about the true T stage of early lesions. As mentioned previously, the lymph node metastasis risk increases as the depth of, info of invasion increases. So for lesions who are T1, but limited to the epithelium or above the muscularis mucosa, the chances for the squamous cell carcinomas are very low and even lower for adenocarcinomas. And this is an in absolute indication for doing an EMR or EST for early cancers of the esophagus. When the depth of in invasion increases to the uh, muscularis mucosa, or 200 micrometers of the uh, submucosa, that is M1 lesions. Then uh, for squamous cell carcinomas, the risk for lymph node metastasis increases very much and also for the adenocarcinomas. So this is a relative indication to do uh, endoscopic treatments for early cancers of the esophagus. Uh, it is very important that uh, the pathologist should confirm that the lymphovascular infiltration on pathology is negative. And if you see a lymphovascular infiltration, then the endoscopic treatment is not enough. Um, Sorry, you have two minutes to go. You have two minutes to go. Sorry. Okay. I will finish it very soon. And uh, endoscopic management al algorithm for the uh, for the uh, uh, treatment of early cancers of the esophagus, based on uh, on the Japanese guidelines, is that if you have a T1A limited to epithelium or above the muscularis mucosa, then uh, you can go through the endoscopic resection. I think that it's not important whether it is our less than 33 fold or all the circumference is involved. If even if the old in, uh, circumference is involved, we can we can still have the endoscopic resection as an option. But uh, if it is an T1A with muscularis mucosa involvement, then uh, we should uh, uh, we should consider uh, the other. Uh, things about the patient, that the age, the comorbidities, the patient willingness, and then we can consider adjoint 
chemotherapy, local radiotherapy, even surgery, if we think that the local treatment with endoscopic methods has not been enough. And uh, after the endoscopic resection, if uh, we have the uh, uh, T1A epithelium or lamina propria uh, mucosa uh, above the muscular mucosa environment, then the patient needs a follow up very frequently with CT scans, endoscopy, just to ch check for metachronous cancers, not only in the esophagus, but also in the stomach. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Renayer. Uh, it was a very nice presentation. Uh, once again, I want to appreciate uh, from all of my colleagues uh, for, for your nice presentation. And also I sincerely appreciate your attendance and collaboration. I hope so you see, we see you very soon. And in order to have a group photo, my, my uh, colleague give uh, an access to your microphone and also video. And we have, uh, we can write down we can have a group photo. Okay, so this will work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I guess I'm going to have to design this for something. So uh, you have all the people have access to the microphone. Thank you for putting this together. Very well done and uh, very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and see you next week at this time. See you next. See you very soon. Thank you very much. Be in person next time. Thank you, bye. Thank you, Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. Thank من میگم باور نمی کنید عروض از دیشب اصلیش کردی من میرم دنبالیش بشیم سر جات گرسی تو کار سر و شوهر دخالت نکنی بشیم خیلی ممنون از حضورتون و کمکی که کردین در دعوت پروفسور پاتین خواهش میکنم بسیار ممنون از شما و برنامه بسیار بسیار ارزندتون واقعا خسته نباشیم بسیار عالی بفرمایید که فارسی تشکر کنید که آدم راحت نباشید واقعا Thank you, bye.